million people with your own story every day, every news day. We make sense of all the noise because you need to know what's important for you, your family, your business, and how it affects your story. Breaking news, the top stories, all the sports updates as they come in, and the very latest entertainment news from Nigeria and the world. Our stories are your story. From our headquarters in Lagos, our Rise News Day for three hours every day. Make every day a news day. Working for Arise remains one of the most enjoyable jobs I've had in my career. It was exhilarating. No day was ever the same. Some days were exhausting. Some days were beyond exciting. But I can guarantee you that no day was ever the same. We interviewed a plethora of people, everybody from Lupita Nyong'o to Alicia Keys to Neo to Tyson Beckford to Gladys Knight. The list goes on and on. It's one of the only shows where you could interview a literary titan and a rapper in one episode. It was never a dull moment at Arise. And one of the things I love most about that network is that Nduka really gave us all an opportunity to find our voices, to work as hard as we could, and to deliver the best product every day. He trusted us, he believed in us, he had faith in us, and we helped him build a global network. And here we are, 10 years later, Arise, still standing. Many networks have come and gone. Some people have tried, many have failed, but here Arise is. Congratulations, Arise. Happy, happy anniversary. Good morning out there. You're watching The Morning Show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. I'm Ayo Mairo Essie. And I'm Rafael Senior. We've got a great show lined up for you for the next three hours. So sit back, relax, and let's kickstart your day. Because The Morning Show begins right now. Benue State Governor Samuel Otom has raised the alarm, alleging that there are plots by some Fulani elite to eliminate him. The governor, who made a remark while addressing newsmen in Makadi yesterday, insisted that he will not be intimidated by anyone to back down from his fight against the invasion 
of the state by Fulani terrorists from other parts of Africa. Otom was reacting to a write-up signed by 52 personalities of Fulani extraction, led by the deposed Emir of Kano, Lamido Sanusi, in form of a letter to the president in which the group leveled all manner of accusations against the governor in a desperate attempt to set him up for hatred, vilification, and attacks. The governor further vowed not to back down in protecting the interests of his people until the day he leaves office. Joining us later on this program from Makadi Benue State is His Excellency Samuel Autumn, Governor of Benue State. Moving things along, we shall be engaging Professor Christopher Imumolen, the youngest presidential candidate in Nigeria flying the flag of Accord Party. He will be telling us why he wants to become Nigeria's next president in the forthcoming general election. Also joining us on the show to talk about his governorship vision for Lagos State is Olufun Shaw Doherty, governorship candidate of the Action Democratic Congress, ADC. Let's catch up on news making headlines across the globe. Back Wilson gives us an update on global business outlook. While Ruth Sudiri updates us on Africa business activities across the continent, Erin Akurjela we are taking us through spot activities across the globe. We'll also review today's newspaper with the rise news analyst Emmanuel Efeni. While our job will fill us in on what's trending around the world. It's going to be all that and a whole lot more today on The Morning Show. Welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. President Muhammad Buhari has congratulated the Rise News on its 10-year anniversary. He praised the channel's efforts in promoting pride among Nigerians, saying, and I quote, I pay my respect to Arise News on this iconic historic occasion, marking a proud chapter in the development of broadcasting industry in the country. I urge you not to just give news, but also to mold the thinking of our people to appreciate positive developments brought about under the ages of the change agenda of our administration. He added that the media should continue to lead the way in transforming society, end of quote. Presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abaka, has also congratulated Arise News on its 10-year anniversary. He hailed Arise as one that holds great promises, saying, and I quote, 10 years after, Arise has become a broadcast channel of choice that has deployed IT and innovation in telling the African and Nigerian story in refreshing ways. I'm proud of the TV network for a decade of groundbreaking journalism, end of quote. All right, when we get all the galas, we talk about it too. Mm -hmm. So a decade of groundbreaking journalism. I have to repeat what the uh, presidential candidate of the PDP said. And thank you, Mr. President, for um, acknowledging and recognizing the great work that Arise News Channel has done over the years, 10 years. Bill Moyer said, American journalist and political commentator, that uh, it, the quality of democracy and the quality of journalism are deeply entwined. Therefore, if we must see a thriving democracy, then we must have a thriving media. We must have thriving journalists. And so I really must applaud uh, the Arise News Channel's team. And allow me at this point to pay tribute to the people at um, Arise who, who, who've made this dream and vision of 10 years ago become such a great reality. Obviously, starting with the chairman and founder, the visionaire, uh, Prince Undukao Baigbena, who has worked tirelessly and has proven through his track record in media, 28 years of this day newspaper, 20 years with the Arise um, Fashion Week, which is currently ongoing, and now 10 years of Arise. Perhaps the big question we should ask him is, what next? So be, now that we have told the story of the world from an African perspective on the platform of Arise News Channel, the, um, the reward for good work is more work. So, sir, this is putting a thought to you on a challenge that what is the next big thing in media from your bike being at stables? Dr. Bati. Okay, we already paid our own tributes at a previous occasion to, uh, you know, the DJ group, to Arise News at 10, to the Arise Fashion Week. The main comment is on what the president has said and what Atiku Abubakar has said. And congratulations are in order. It's a fitting recognition of how Arise News and the entire, you know, Arise News this day group, you know, has been able to promote the African story, promote the narrative. And it's good to see the president, you know, congratulating 
Arise News. And also Atiku Abubaka congratulating Arise News and joining Arise News and this day newspaper which both belong to the same group. However, to both persons, I think what is more important for leaders is to promote the role of the media in society and for our leaders to continue to realize that the role of the media is a constitutional role under Section 22 of the Constitution and also Section 39 of the 1999 Constitution. What we have seen before now is harassment of the media, both by state actors and non-state actors, and every attempt to abbreviate the scope for free expression. What Arise News represents, what the Disney Group represents, is its promotion of the scope for free expression, the defense of the voiceless, giving voice to the voiceless in society, and that is where the objectives of governance and that of the media should coalesce. So for President Buhari, that is living, he still has one major assignment, the uh, uh, 2023 general elections. And to ensure that in fitting, in keeping with this is praise for Arise News and this day, that he defends the rights of the media. And also that whoever is coming in as president, whether it is Atiku or the APC or Labour Party or the NMPP, realize, realizes that the media is part of the development process. So it's not uh, yeah, it's something that goes beyond, you know, uh, now. It is something that goes into the future, and we hope that the media will be given its pride of place as a fourth state of the realm. I mean, congrats, and thanks, President Mohamed Buhari and Elijah Ateko Abaka for those very, very warm words. But the truth has to be told. Arise has not thrived in isolation. It has done this because of its own dogged spirit, even when people drop the ball most of the time. And I talk about political actors fighting and trying to gag the press. Arise is what it is today because of the appreciation of the fact that it is only a robust media that can save society and, might I add, a waning society in this regard. And that's why Arise has positioned itself as a beacon of hope, and it will continue to state its own side and the side of everybody, all the stakeholders, giving a balance to all, despite the gagging and the threats of the press. Arise has not been immune from the shenanigans of politicians that try to silence voices and cut us off. But we are resolute. And it's not going to be an easy road. It's going to be a hard road, but we will continue. Because for us, we know that for every story told objectively with balance can create the panacea for liberation for millions of people out there. Information and also emancipation from the hitherto mental slavery that people have been ingrained in. So it is cheers to many more years, cheers to another 10 years of doggedness and the fight continuing and the road being rough. Like Taisha Larry says, may your road be rough. It's been rough. It's been better. It will be rough. It will be better again. But most importantly, kudos to the man that strings all of this together. Which I will have to give special commendation for today by saying that he is the man that allows the best ideas win in the newsroom. We're just three weeks away from the presidential election, and for the APC, it's been divisive few days. There are dozens of headlines about the clash between the governor of Kaduna and Nasir El Rufai and the presidency. El Rufai is a supporter of Bola Tinubu and has suggested. Some people in the presidential villa are working against him. The government has denied that. Charles Sanyagulu spoke to El Rufai a little bit earlier, uh, began by asking about his accusations. Let me restate exactly what I said. Uh, I'm a quantity surveyor. I, I am mathematically uh, uh, tuned to be accurate, even in my use of words. What I said was, we are convinced that there are elements in the villa, some elements in the villa that want 
APC to lose the elections. I did not say the federal government. I did not say Asiwa Jibola Tinubu. I said APC, all right? Um, so I don't understand why the federal government is responding to what I said, because the federal government is not part of it. And I referred to elements in the villa, and I know who I'm referring to, and those that are in the villa know who I'm referring to. And with the greatest respect, even Lai Mohammed, my brother, knows who I'm referring to. And I think it's inappropriate for him, as Minister of Information of Nigeria, to respond to a statement that specifically referred to individuals rather than any institution. If I had said the villa is against us, then I would expect Garba Shehu or, 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 or uh, Adeshina, my, my two brothers, to respond to me. If I said the federal government was frustrating the APC, then I would expect Lai Mohammed to respond. Why he responded to that, I, don't, I cannot uh, fathom, uh, frankly. Um, I still stand by my words that there is there appears to be very strong evidence of a conspiracy to incite voters against the APC in the forthcoming elections uh, by coming up with ad hoc decisions uh, and policies that are not well thought out, that have not uh, received wide, widespread consultation and a whole of government approach uh, to, 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 to incite the voters to vote against the APC at all levels. Let's talk higher. All right. So um, that's uh, um, Governor Nasser El Rufai mm. speaking and just clarifying the statement that a number of people that has got tongues wagging, literally, across political circles and um, around. We've, we analyzed this yesterday. The first thing I have to mention, and very quickly because of our time, is this, that now he said that there are elements in government, not necessarily just clearly stated, not the federal government, not the president. And yesterday we talked about the fact that they were exonerating the president from um, culpability. Therefore, that he's not the one who's come up with these policies that are making the lives of Nigerians so difficult that it's, it's pushing them to want to vote against the APC in the next elections. What many Nigerians want to know is if he could expose these elements. If there are people who are fighting against the goodwill or the fighting against the, the prosperity of the nation, I believe that it behoves Governor Nasir El Rafai to expose them. He did mention in, a, in, a, in, a, in another interview that rather than exposing them, victory against them would be sweeter than exposing them, but that in due time he would expose them. Then the second and final part I'd just like to address is this thing around it's not the president, the people speaking to him. I mean, I mean, he said that the reason for the redesign of the Naira and this policy is that the cabals advised him in this manner and then he agreed to it. Then you want to ask the question that who is the head of government? Who is the head of state? The quality of good leadership, the hallmark of the quality of a good leader is the ability to take ownership and responsibility in good times and in bad times. Therefore, it is not enough to say that the president is being moved by people. He is the CEO of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He is the one that is responsible and accountable to Nigerians. Dr. Bati? Okay. I think a series of questions. Um, Nasir Rufai, the governor of Cardinal State, has been on a media blitz in the last 48 hours. He has appeared on every major channel. He's been on Channel TV. He has been on TVC. He has been on BBC House of Service. He has also appeared on Arise News, uh, pushing the same narrative of a narrow redesign and fresh scarcity. And if you look at it critically, he seems to have become the interim spokesperson for the point made by the uh, APC presidential candidate in Abeokuta and in Calabar. So the question is, what is his motive? We didn't see him uh, coming out this aggressively before now, even though he was he's part of the campaign. So why now? Two, some people have said, well, the motive is probably an attempt to force down the truth of the government, uh, a review of the Naira redesign policy. So what, again, is the motive? That's a question to ask. Three. He says the president can be exonerated. That is, the president is not at fault in any way. But he said in 2021, he advised the president to remove first subsidy, but that the fifth columnist did not allow the president to do so. 
Okay, did he also advise the president that there is poverty in the land, that there is unemployment in the land, that inflation reaches over 21 percent? Did he also advise the president that uh, ways and means of 22.7 uh, trillion is going to jeopardize the future of Nigeria? So exonerating the president and exonerating the CBN governor looks like a tactical move. Again, what is the motive? Number three, he says he will disclose the uh, identity of the fifth columnists on February 27, after the elections. Why does he have to wait till February 27? Why not before the election? Why not now? Before he shows up on another TV station uh, around this period. Number four, five now. He used the, uh, his appearance on some of the TV channels to abuse other candidates. In fact, he says uh, Peter Obi is just a Nollywood actor and that uh, you know he's better off in uh, uh, Nollywood. Okay, why the obsession with other political parties when the APC itself has very uh, serious uh, problems? So, but in due course, we will see what all of this is all about. Uh, but I'm sure Nasir Rufai will defend himself and say that uh, he has a right to his own opinions, as does everyone else. I mean, we are not surprised. It's targeted, and it's politics season. But the question we should ask is, number one, who are those people? Can he name them? I doubt if he can name them, because it's all part of a political game. The problem now is that President Muhammad Buhari's decision with the Naira policy is affecting them. They cannot mop up a lot of cash. You are seeing the blowback on the lives of the people because the cash the politicians are mopping up, the little naira that is in circulation that they are mopping up, is leading to the scarcity for average Nigerians like you and me. That's why people go to the ATM card, they can't get it, and the banks say they don't have. So that game is already playing out. And they tried last week because the president giving an extension was as a result of certain meetings held last week. And that's why here... We hope that President Buhari has the political will to follow through this. Another meeting is going to happen today. We hope after that meeting, we don't get more extensions. Please, President Muhammadu Buhari, this is your legacy to the hard suffering Nigerians. Let it be. Free and fair elections. Do not allow anybody to convulate things for you. Because after the meeting last week, we got extension. Hope after meetings this week, we will not get another extension. He says he has evidence. He should provide the evidence that people are conspiratorial. They don't want the APC candidate to get it. So this is a political game that I'm sure that Nigerians are reading. All of a sudden, like Dr. Badi pointed out, a media blitz, four top media houses, even the BBC House of Service, stoking up the conversation. Sometimes I will have wished that he puts the same effort to the insecurity in his states in the cry for help. But it's politics season. And you see, when politicians, they need, the thing they know how to do is to blow the whistle and to be very cryptic, but they will not say it all. Just like we remember the certain governor that said at a point in time, he was going to announce people for him to support, but we never heard anything. Why wait till the 27th? Say it now. But one more point that should be added. Uh, Why is it only the APC complaining? Dr. Abati, there are 18 presidential candidates. But we know. It's only the APC grumbling. It is obvious. The political whistle was first blown in Abel Kuta. Since then, all of them have been going in that circle. Hear all their surrogates. They don't want to directly attack the president. So they attack Emefili first. And when you say justify the attack, they can't justify the attack. Oh, the president is not the bad person. Hear all the surrogates in the coming days. It's one refrain. Emefele, Emefele, Emefele. But when meetings were held last week, it was with the president. And Emefele had to comply. Please, President Muhammadu Buhari, you signed electoral laws into B. The thing we tout as your legacy is this electoral law. Please ensure you deliver free and fair elections. Nigerians will love you for it and respect you.
time will tell. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Michael Wilson wrote to the to give us updates on global and Africa business to give you stay with us. We'll be right back. Customers, download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Hey, it's Kilo. How are you doing, son? How are you doing? One thousand. We go once play tire. How are you doing now? Madam, hello, hello, hello. Brother, now three thousand five. My phone in your walk, a card, the glow, a leg bearer, ten thousand. Oh, yeah. Bring your phone. Ha! Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Yes, my people, now, wow. One thousand are credit. Now, you're so to ten thousand. Now, 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 now. All of us don't know about glow bereketé. Ni lo po me wa ni si. Show ti bo. I lo po me wa lo ma gba. Lori eke eto bara. Sori ohun ipe glow bereketé 10 times e re. I told you. Now wa go tell. A day to remember in the history of our dear country, Nigeria. Nine wise men from the north who were governors came together on June 8th, 2022 to stand for equity and fairness in the interest of our nation, Nigeria. They buried personal interest for the unity of our country. They supported the call that power must shift to the south in 2023. They chose a Nigeria agenda. We salute our brothers and sisters in the northern part of this country who, in spite of their vote advantage, continue to propagate the unity of Nigeria by promoting rotation of presidency between the north and southern part of the country. Let voters in the north follow the move by these leaders. Vote for power shift to the south. It's the turn of the south to produce the president in 2023. Let's vote for Latino for president for a renewed hope of better Nigeria. Vote Kashim Shetima as vice president. Vote APC. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. For global business updates, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Uh, mixed picture, usually, as usual, from Asia Pacific, quite honestly. Uh, although a lot of them are gaining, a, a lot of stocks there are gaining a bit of confidence from the fact that the, the Fed, as you know, didn't raise rates very aggressively when it reported it, only about a quarter of a percent. But that's, that's been enough to give it a certain amount of optimism, as has the private cakes in um, pr production managers index. Um, it showed that industrial activity picked up um, in China. Um, and uh, China, it, China's ten cent is also wishing to expand into Singapore to take uh, uh, to take advantage of opening borders and more Chinese tourists going there and using uh, r ride hailing apps, for example, um, which which they are diversifying uh, diversifying into as far as their relationship with Singaporean companies is concerned. So bright um, bright trade prospects i think from asia pacific even though it's not necessarily reflected in stocks right as we speak um as far as uh, the downy group is concerned um you remember we talked about it yesterday on the mumbai stock exchange um it was down about uh, 35 percent it's down at least 30 percent uh, on the year uh, the, the man himself Gautam uh, Adani who is uh, who, who's facing allegations of uh, corruption and the rest of it uh, and stock manipulation um, is has lost about uh, 59 billion dollars worth of um, of his own personal fortune as a result of this the, the, the case continues as i was saying yesterday i think what's going to happen is that the uh, indian equivalent of the sec will get involved and and start to pick the company uh, apart as far as these allegations are concerned let's turn our attention to the united states and big tech blues really was the bottom line there um the u.s fed's uh, smaller uh, interest rate rise um acted quite well really so apple however though saw sales drop by five percent i'm just going to rush to them alphabet missed on its uh, on its own earnings that's the that's the google owner youtube for, fell short as did google amazon um, beat some of uh, what the, what analysts were, were expecting um and meta shares were generally up um as a result of um uh, in fact meta shares had one of the best days in a decade mark zuckerberg was on stage all, as it were and he was actually saying that the company is going to get better and be run more efficiently and i'll finally round it off with starbucks um they, they, they've been they've been slightly hit because of the problems in china china is its second largest market um and uh, and, and, and slight, slightly, so st a slight blues feeling across these kind of big results which were eagerly awaited yesterday. Right, let's talk about the IMF and the IMF is, is being um, urged by um, allies of Ukraine to approve um, more money. The EU has earmarked 16 billion, uh, sorry, already 18 billion for this. Um, Ukraine needs 38 billion. It's hoped that pressure from some of Ukraine's allies will force the IMF to act and if the IMF does act um, they think that it will actually encourage other donors in to reconstruct the country um, the EC the ECB now Christine Lagarde um, she uh, cautiously I mean it's difficult one to, to get right this I, I, I think they, I think they were conditionally hawkish they're still saying that they need to um, they need to contain inflation but it, it, it i mean it's going to be really interesting in march actually they're meeting there as to what they do with interest rates because what they don't want to do is strangle off um, the weak growth in the eu right now but that's the message that they gave yesterday along with their half percent uh, rise and um, the uk similar half a percent rise from the bank of england sunak the prime minister is saying rishi sunak is saying that britain cannot afford to give what he calls massive pay rises for nurses um, meanwhile the bank of england um as i said it raised interest rates half a half a percent yesterday but um andrew and that, that, that was a 72 72 majority of the of the nine person um rate setting board so rates up to four percent but still still the still the, the bank of england uh, and andrew bailey very worried about strangling growth and so on and they they are but they are they they are also predicting that uh, inflation may fall to within a target of 2% sometime uh, next year. Um, the UK is also um, 
in, in, in competition with a lot of other uh, a lot of other countries, particularly the EU as a block to attract crypto businesses to London. What they're proposing, and they haven't they haven't finished it yet, but they are proposing new regulations which will uh, which will subject cryptocurrencies to the same or similar kind of regulation uh, that other financial sectors have to endure. And oil prices basically in no man's land at the moment. Um, just the feeling of a soft and shallow recession not doing a great deal. We need some positive, more positive news out of China, I think, to affect that. And as far as cryptos are concerned, I mean, that what cryptocurrencies are gaining on the fact that the rest the rest of uh, the rest of the financial world is sort of just a just slightly risk on mood. In other words, going to riskier assets and and um, Bitcoin and the rest of them, the rest of the cryptos are actually um, benefiting from that. That's the global view this morning. Real quickly, I'd like to talk about Adani because what is really happening here is that an American company is attacking one of the biggest companies out of Asia, saying there's fraud in the system. This is the Heidenberg Research company. And now the stocks are plummeting. Yesterday, there was a public, there was a private sales of shares for some, for some possible investors. 2.5 billion was raised. And Adani had to return the money coming out to say because of this crisis. So is this the West attacking the rise of India? Because as Heidenberg put out empirical proof to what is really calling out in the Adani group, I, I, I think I think your suspicions are are probably right. I mean, it, it, may, it may well be an attack. I think what I prefer to do is wait until we've heard the investigation that will no doubt follow this um, as to as to what Hindenburg's motives actually are and and how and how correct they are as far as Adani is concerned. I really do feel we have to wait for that investigation. I think it'll be fairly full and full and frank and so on. But I, I feel that we should we should wait. It, 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 I think it would be wrong at this stage. It looks it looks like exactly what you're saying but I think it'd be wrong at this stage to draw too many conclusions until a full probe actually takes place and we see we see all the evidence of what of what's going on but as you were saying yesterday you know it, it adds to the argument of stopping short selling doesn't it all right Michael so let's go to the UK and the Bank of England's reports particularly uh, what's projected by the Bank of England estimating a 0 0.7 percent growth in the UK by 2025 Compared to the decades before COVID, that's less than half, 1.7%. Now, what's, what for me is quite interesting is the fact that they, they've identified a shrunken workforce as one of the major reasons for this projection. And, you know, the apathy of, you know, um, people of working age in the UK, about 80% of them not wanting to go into work. For the UK government, this poses quite a big challenge. What are some of the incentives to get people of work age back to work or interested in going to work? No, no, no politician, as far as I know, certainly not within my lifetime, has succeeded in that. I think, I think there is a shrunken workforce, but I think also what the UK is very bad at is productivity. It is the lowest um, in, in, in the G7. And that, that's, that's a, a magic pill that tends to work. And it was to get more work out of an existing number of people actually at work. And n nobody has achieved that um, in, in Britain. And it's very, very difficult to achieve in any countries as well. And how you get, how you get people... Uh, uh, Specifically, uh, since the since the, the the introduction of those furlough um, giveaways, how you get them actually back to work is 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 a mystery. I mean, either you feel it or you don't, and and it, you, you've got to make going back to work um, worthwhile. Now, whether that means cutting benefits or not, and I don't think any politician is going to be brave enough to do that because as Sunak as as saying was saying last weekend in a lot of um, in a lot of newspaper articles, you know, when he was chancellor, he was happy to give this money away but he knew it would come back and bite him when when it had to be paid for um, and i think that's that's what you're seeing right now so i think the big concern from the bank of england yes they will get the rate of inflation down uh, but they're, they're they're very very worried about about the the actual the cost of living within the system, and I think that's that's probably their biggest worry. They don't want to the same as in the United States, the same with the EU. They they want to they want to bite down on inflation, but they don't want to strangle the economy at the same time. Very very difficult trick to, to pull off. And and you're absolutely right to to concentrate on this shrunken workforce. I would add productivity lack of lack of um, in, in that equation as well. Well, two quick things, Michael. The first one, the Adani Group. Gautam Adani used to boast that uh, 
you know, the Adani Enterprises is too big to fail. And when that report came from the short seller, uh, Hindenburg, uh, he said, uh, well, this was an attack on India. But it's not only Hindenburg that, is, uh, that pointed out the accounting fraud and, uh, you know, uh, going to save events. Fitch, the Fitch Group, in August 2022, made a similar claim. So it looks like those, uh, you know, companies, they've won against Adani. But the issue is, how does this affect India? Experts are saying that the government of Narendra Modi will have to bail out the Adani group because of the implications from the middle class that is heavily exposed for the national insurance company and also the reputational damage to India Incorporated. What do you think? Secondly, Shell just posted the biggest profit in his 115 years, over $40 billion. This week, ExxonMobil reported uh, uh, $56 billion. The only company we're still expecting from is uh, Total Energies, uh, hopefully by uh, next week. Now, in England, people are saying, look, th these companies should be taxed more. But I know you, are, you have your reservations about that. But with this uh, outrageous... Uh, you know, profits that the unions are complaining about. Do you still hold that position? I, I, do, I do. I mean, I, I don't like this word outrageous, if I may say so, because I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, it's just a fact of life. The energy prices are rising because of all the reasons that we know. And these, 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 these companies have profited, profited upon that. Um, I, and I, as I always do, take you back to 2020, April the 20th, uh, 2020, when the oil price was negative and these companies were not making money. I'm not speaking in support of them. I'm just talking about the reality of it. I think what's going to be far more interesting is to see, and I was saying this yesterday when these, when these results came out from Shell. Yes, you're absolutely right to highlight them. But what I think is, ha what I think is going to be interesting is how the amount of cash that they're generating helps them to transition to their renewable energy targets of which i still understand in this country particularly are 2030 what they are in the other, in other parts of the world i'm not quite sure but that is the interesting thing and a diversified company like shell however much it actually makes its profit that is going to be the interesting thing how they use that that pile of cash to get to their renewable targets as far as adani is concerned i would just repeat what i was saying to rifia earlier on you know that we wait we wait to see i think it's done a lot of reputational damage to india uh, modi needs to speak out i see that everybody's going to get caught up in this but it will take it will take time and i, I i'd much prefer to wait until the official investigation which there will surely be um, and, and if there's not they're in a lot of trouble but um, there will surely be an official investigation until that takes place um i'd I prefer to keep my powder dry on it to be honest well thank you very much michael thank you very much it's now time for a short break on the morning show. When we return, we'll have a Rise News analyst, Emmanuel Efeni, join us to review top stories in today's newspapers. Stay with us. Adjust to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. Contact us today and let us take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. to serve better breakfast. If you're in Lagos, you need to see this. I'm not just streaming content. 
I'm just a skinny child here. Get more data to enjoy exclusive content. Dial star 141 hash now. Airtel, the smartphone oh. network. Hi, I'm Pat Rankin, and they don't call me what best for no reason. I only deal with the best, be it auto or business. A 100% claim is always guaranteed. Welcome to World Class Insurance Services. We are Anchor Insurance. We are insurance through the works. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Arise News analyst Emmanuel Efeni. Good, good morning, Good Manuel. morning, Ruben. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Ayo. Good morning. Yes, let's start the review with this day, Nigeria's newspaper of record. The lead story, uh, no, just before the lead story, let's start with the window story. Uh, Buhari rejoices with Arise News Channel on its 10th anniversary. Yes, hails organization's effort in reading Nigeria of colonial uh, mindset. Yes, um, of course, uh, this day, Arise Media Group is celebrating, and we have every reason to celebrate on these 10 years of Arise News Channel. And um, Buhari, the President Muhammadu Buhari, the president, of course, should be proud of what Arise News Channel has done in the global media space. And um, his commendation, his felicitation, is what uh, we are also basking. Uh, tells you the federal government is also basking on the accomplishments and the achievement of Arise News Channel. And of course, we're marking it with uh, the Arise uh, 20th edition of Arise Fashion Week. And then, um, of course, the 28th year anniversary of this day, Nigeria's newspaper of record. Now, the lead story CBN authorizes over the counter payment of new Naira notes, vows to prosecute sellers, abusers of local currency says queues at ATMs to disappear soon. Trains 30,000 super agents in Quara. Ahmed, pains associated with currency swap, temporary sacrifice for a uh, Sena economy. 
that's the Minister of uh, Finance saying that, says uh, Buhari unhappy seeing Nigeria, Nigerians suffer. Traditional rulers drum support for cashless policy as APS bans continues sensitization. Yes, the cashless policy and the pains of distributing the new Naira notes uh, is still very much apparent as you walk along the streets, greeted with long queues on various uh, ATMs of different banks. And um, well, these measures put in place by uh, the central bank pay the new currency over the counter, but I hope that will change something. Is this, do they, the banks have enough in their votes? Because we still hear of uh, people being turned back after waiting for a long while and you are told no more currency to distribute. But we just hope this will fizzle out as central bank has promised. Now, if we look at the Guardian newspaper, uh, CSOs, picket offices as banks beam searchlight on branch managers. Yes, could branch managers be the problem? Federal government concern, Naira swap is necessary pain. Well, I hope the banks will take responsibility because perhaps we'll start naming and shaming banks that are putting their customers through pains, but we, 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 don't, we hope we won't get to that point. Uh, because if the banks get the currency sent to their branches and some crooked uh, fellows at the branch level hoard, sell, and make customers to suffer, then there is a problem in our hands, really. So all hands should be on deck to ensure that unscrupulous persons within the banking system don't put Nigeria through these pains. That is, if indeed they have enough new notes within the bank vaults. Now, um, the Daily Trust newspaper, Naira Crisis, APC governors reject February 10 deadline. Tell Emifili, sorry, yeah, tell Emifili people are paying to get their, their money. Demand one year extension to meet Buhari today. Protests in Lagos, military operations suffer as troops in bushes cash trap. Only masses are suffering. Politicians having their way. Kwan Kwan So, uh, Rabbi Kwan Kwan So, the presidential candidate of the New Nigerian People's Party, the one making uh, that statement. Well, should the deadline be extended? Well, the APC governors have come up with another. Uh, point they are going to push to the president. Will the president listen to them? We think, I believe if they can get through these hiccups, these bottlenecks that is making Nigerians a queue for us to get 20,000 Naira or less, as the case may be in some banks, then there will be no need for this long extension. The APC governors are conversing till the end of the year. But these are issues uh, that we have to deal with as February 10 deadline approaches. Now, the New Telegraph newspaper also uh, has that story. Emifili directs banks to pay new notes over the counter. Now, the Daily Sun newspaper, I just look at the story beside the, the masthead. No seat at home order in Southeast on election day. IPOP. Yes, good to hear this, that IPOP also want election because, you know, when IPOP gives instruction in the East, in the Southeast, well, people comply because they don't want to get hurt. All manner of people, whether Eastern Security Network and other Elements take advantage of this uh, uh, shutdown, especially on Mondays, to unleash mayhem when people try to defy that. So it's good to hear that IPOP also is very much interested in having this election, uh, the general election, February 25 and March 11, take place in the South 
East without hiccup. Yeah. Now, the Nigerian Tribune newspaper. Um, yes, I just leave the, the lead story, which has to do with the Naira uh, exchange. Now, the story uh, just beside the photograph there. PDP accuses Wiki of anti-party activities, denies working with APC. Yes, because, uh, yes, recall that uh, the reason uh, Governor Wiki gave for cancelling the permit given to the PDP for the use of, of the uh, Adokia Mesemaka Stadium was that some groups within uh, the APC were also coming to join uh, the PDP rally. And of course, Tony Cole, the governorship candidate of APC, was mentioned, which he has since denied as there's no such arrangement. And of course, the PDP saying that Wiki is just, uh, is just uh, uh, playing politics with the, the stadium. Of course, we expect every governor in every state to give all political parties um, access to public facilities to use for their campaigns irrespective of how they feel about that party. It doesn't matter if the party is your own party and you remain aggrieved over time. Now, the Business Day newspaper, Nigerians seek foreign degrees as local faculty quality flounders. Yes. Unfortunately, oh, that's all we have. The producers are saying your segment has timed out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining okay. us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Nigeria has a problem. A really big problem. The problem has made our country sick. And we cannot remain sick for four more years. Nigeria is sick with insecurity, poverty, rising cost of living, and an escalating Japan crisis. The good thing is, Nigeria has a pathway to recovery. And when we recover, our country will be safe. When we recover, our economy will grow. When we recover, our nation will be stronger. We have to recover from this sickness. So we can recover from lost ground. Recover our time. Recover our future. And our dignity. On the African continent. In 2023, it is Nigeria time to recover. And together, we can get it done. A few months after Arise launched in 2013, I was brought in as executive producer of Arise Review, a Sunday morning show that took an in-depth look at the week's major stories. Each program was packed with live satellite interviews with newsmakers around the world, as well as terrific in-studio guests. And thanks to a very talented staff, we turned out programs that, in my opinion at least, rivaled anything on the American Network shows. Um, after about a year, I was tapped by Nduka to head up the specials and documentary unit. As the Black Lives Matter movement gained traction, we were producing hard-hitting specials, exposing the discrimination and the danger people of color face all too often in America. But of all the specials, the one I'm most proud of was our documentary, Game Changers. It's the story of the early days of the legendary Harlem Globetrotters. Back in the 1940s, if you were black, you weren't allowed to play in the NBA. So an independent team, the Harlem Globetrotters, was formed. And they were amazing. The Trotters could outplay just about everyone in the NBA had they been allowed to compete. Their incredible athleticism, their precision, and their fun-loving antics made them superstars. Although celebrated wherever they went around the world, they were treated like second-class citizens in their own country. We were able to track down a, an interview a number of the uh, former trotters, including 
such great names as Meadowlark Lemon, Marcus Haynes, and Will Chamberlain. Yes, before becoming a two-time NBA champion, Will Stilt was a trotter. Compelling interviews, priceless vintage footage, a great script by Deb Gobble, and a spot-on, heartfelt delivery by Julian Phillips made Game Changers a powerful and poignant program. At least that's what we thought. Fortunately, other TV professionals agreed. We were nominated for an Emmy. Being in that huge ballroom at New York's Hilton Hotel, crowded with hundreds of nominees, is an unforgettable experience. At our table were co-producers Mary Lou Yacoub and Janet DeHart, writer Deb Gobble, who I already mentioned, um, one of the trotters, Carl Green, and to bring us luck, OJ was there. Have to be honest, it's pretty nerve wracking. Among the competitors were all the big players, the flagship stations of ABC, NBC, CBS, as well as Madison Square Garden and the Yes Networks and dozens and dozens of others. And for each category, they would read the nominees and like you see on TV, they would then open it up an envelope and announce the winner. And the Emmy goes to Arise <laughs> When they announced our name, I think we all cheered loud enough to be heard in Nigeria. Then we made our way through all the tables up to the stage to accept our statuette. At that time, the vast majority in the audience had no idea what a rise was. So I used my acceptance speech as an opportunity to tell the press corps about this incredible new news channel. Winning an Emmy was a wonderful way to introduce a rise to America. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Benue State Governor Samuel Otom has alleged that there is a plot to assassinate him by an unnamed group. During a press conference at the government house in the capital of Makadi, Otom said some people are accusing him of masterminding an alleged genocide against Fulani pastoralists. He says he's been blamed for being responsible for the recent airstrike that claimed the lives of several headers in Kwateri a community bordering Benue and Nasarawa states. I consider this allegation and blackmail targeted at my person and the government of Benue state as part of grand conspiracy by enemies of the state to eliminate me since 2017 when we enacted the open grazing, prohibition, and ranching establishment law. I have escaped seven assassinations attempts. Those behind the evil plots have not hidden their motive. They have made me an enemy for choosing to stand with my people and defending their rights. Our livestock guards operate within the boundaries of Bayway State and not permitted by law to be ours because we are not. Joining us now from Makadi, Bayway State, is Governor Samuel Otom of Bayway State. Thank you very much for joining us, Governor Samuel Otom. Thank you very much, Ruben, well, and the other crew. Welcome to the morning show. Well, very quickly. I mean, um, I've read your reactions to the petition that was purportedly written against you by 52 Fulani elite, as they are described, to the president. 
accusing you of the various things we mentioned in the introduction. But in your response, and also in the response by your spokespersons, they've targeted just one person out of the 52, and that would be Emir Sanusi Lamido Sanusi. He's only the one being targeted as the person, as a mastermind of the allegations against you. Why target one person out of 52 as reported? Secondly, this is a petition written to the president. Have you also considered or have you written a counter petition to the president to explain your side of the story instead of taking the matter straight to the court of public opinion? Thank you very much, Ruben. Um, it was just natural to single the dethrone and depose Emir, former Emir of Kano. And the reason is very simple. He had earlier made a video clip which was circulated widely on social media. And I carefully listened to it. I gave to two people who understand how that very well to interpret it to me. And they did. And they targeted me before the petition was written and signed. And I also saw that on social media. I did say it was an unknown group because they did not mention name, but he was the ring leader. If you look at the petition, he was the first person that signed. So in other words, for me, since he's leading that team, he is responsible uh, for putting the team together. So I mentioned him specifically because he's the figurehead of that plot against me. Secondly, I've also written a petition, a count or a counter petition to the presidency too, because it's, it's amazing. Uh, I don't know where myself or the Benway State government is coming into this matter. Something that took place in Nasarawa State. I paid a condolence visit to my colleague, the governor of Nasarawa State. And this is one of the things that I took up. Then, this petition uh, was not uh, made public. But the video clip I watched, former Emir of uh, Kano, Alaji Sanusi, castigating me and profiling me against and setting me up against the full animation. I made some remarks and I said, look, for prominent people in the society, looking at the security challenges we have today in our country, when something happens, for such a person, he should have access to me or the entire governors in uh, the country. And if something happens, it would have been better for him one to verify from the governor of Nasrallah State where this thing took place. And if possible, he would have called me. He would have tried to confirm for me what really transpired. I'll tell you the truth, the narrative that is going on is wrong. The point is that I did advise that instead of making inflammatory statements that were gravitate and worsen the fragile security situation we have, in a various state, it would have been better to find a way. Even if you want to advise, you advise better than insinuating and profiling someone against an ethnic group. That was wrong. And the following day, I now saw this petition. And he was the ringleader, he was the first person that signed this petition. And I, I felt that. Is it a personal issue? Otherwise, this didn't happen. As my colleague, the governor of Nasrallah State, is my neighbor. I went to him and I condoled with him 
Because I don't know what really transpired. But one thing that is sure, there was a statement from defense headquarters, and I quote, what I can tell you is that we are very professional in the conduct of our operations. They are also intelligence driven. Also, our code of conduct and standard of operations are in tandem with the international best practices. This was a statement from Major General Musa Dam Madami, Director of Defense Media Operations. So if something happened and a statement came out, it would have been better for Sanusi to find out from the defense headquarters further, or best find out from the governor of Nasarawa State what really happened. Because I'm not the governor of Nasarawa State, so I don't know what happened. But for me, I feel that Human lives must be respected. When people are killed, irrespective, irrespective of where they come from or who they are, we should sympathize because it can be us tomorrow. And I went there, the governor lost his son. I used that opportunity to condole with him and also condole with the families of uh, the victims. And as a way of finding uh, peace, between all of us. Everybody knows that there is a prohibition of open grazing law. Whatever we are doing about uh, arresting cattle, it is there in the law. Those cattle that were retrieved were not taken through uh, a manager. They were taken by road because we don't permit it. Once cattle are arrested and fines paid, what we advise people to do is to take them by truck. And in our case, that was what happened. And so uh, everybody knows that uh, we have a law in place. And the remaining uh, 150 cattle that were there, I discussed with my colleague, the governor of National State, and I said, look, for the sake of peace and in sympathy with what has happened, though I have no facts with me, uh, whether what is being the narrative now is true, but I know that people were killed. So in sympathy with them, I had told the governor that the remaining 150 cattle cows should be released. And I paid the fine. I decided on my own, for the sake of peace and sympathy, I paid this. So... I am surprised after defense headquarters have issued a statement on this matter, and it was in the public domain. Right. For Sanusi to come out and profile me was what was strange to me. So I have also written a petition. Okay, Governor Otto. Now, you two things I'd like to just have you clarify. The first is that uh, the 14th Emir, Lamdo Sanusi, has said that one of the grouses he has against you is that you haven't managed well the diversity of um, the people in Benue State, as perhaps your counterparts in Plateau State, Governor Lalong has done. So in terms of your management and handling is one of the criticisms. The second part of my question is with regards to your statement around the attempts on your life seven times since the open grazing prohibition and ranches establishment law was, was passed by yourself. I'd like you to expound on that because that's quite a, that's a heavy um, statement that you have made. Thank you very much. Look, Sanusi is not from the New State, and he cannot be part of what we do here in the New State. He can only advise. And if it's a good advice, we can take it here. That law prohibiting open grazing was the initiative of Benue people. And I represent Benue people. I'm not the governor of Plateau State. But let me ask you, have you not heard? Have you not seen? Have we not witnessed the massacre in Plateau State where people are killed? So how do you advise me? to go and join uh, or recommend Plateau way of doing things. But, you know, I don't want to get into that. There are complexities. There are peculiarities. 
in all the states. I have a different state to manage. My brother, the governor of Batu State, has a different state to manage. You know that initially, when 93 people were killed, 73 people were killed, my brother came out castigating them. But he later sent a delegation to apologize to me that it was wrong for him to have done that. And since then, I have been witnessing series of killings and death and massacre in Plateau State. It is left for my brother to manage. I cannot go and teach him or show him how to manage uh, the security situation in, in Plateau State. We can only share intelligence if we want to help each other. But for Sanusi to tell me that I should use Plateau model, Plateau model, as far as I know, is not better than Benue State, if not worse. If not worse. But he is managing his own things, his own way, that I have to manage my own. There is no law prohibiting open grazing in Baku State. Here there is a law prohibiting open grazing. And this went through due process. State Executive Council, it went through the House of Assembly. Four public hearings were conducted, and all the people involved, pastorialists, and all that were involved. As I talk to you, the implementation of this law is not just targeted at Pulani. It's targeted at everyone who rears cattle. What we are simply saying that if you want to rear cattle in Benue State, you should ranch. And that is it. None of them have come forward to ask for ranching permit and also land to do their ranching. And so the matter is very simple. We're managing our way, and I am being targeted. But the truth is that when you target me, you're targeting Benue people. Okay. Because <clears throat> I am doing this in their, uh, uh, on their behalf. Secondly, the, um, the allegation on attempts on your life. The allegation. Seven, att seven attempts. It is very seven good times. And this came from Fulanese themselves. One of it was on Boko Road when I went to the farm. And everybody saw it. The Inspector General of Police sends uh, the then um, uh, intelligent police officer uh, who is now in prison. He came here and I was told that 17 people were arrested. As I talk to you up to today, nobody has been prosecuted. All those people were released. And so the, 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 the other one, it was the Fulanese themselves that came to me to reveal to me that this were their attempts to eliminate me. And they were surprised that each time they attempt, they fail. So it came from the Fulanese themselves. I still have Fulani people here. I don't send anybody away. But the law also uh, prohibit cattle rustling. So that one, they will not talk about it. As I talk to you, there are certain people who are T people, the Doma people, who rustled cattle, and they were arrested and prosecuted, and some are in prison, as I talk to you, just like the, 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 some other headers who violate our law. We take them. We have not discriminated, uh, discriminated in enforcing our law here in Benue State. We are law-abiding. We believe in the right thing to do. Everything we do here, we do it according to the law. And the Constitution allows me. This is one of the allegations that they raise against me, that why should the presidency allow me to be operating a law prohibiting open grace? And I feel very okay. sad because okay. these okay. are okay. people. Okay. Certain people. Okay. Governor, th thank you so much. There's a lot of ground to cover. And uh, good to see you. Happy New Year to you. Uh, real quickly, I I'd like to ask, have you been able to reach out to Emia Sadusi? Have you confirmed that video, you know, independently verified the video of what he said? Have you reached out to him and the group? Secondly, I'd also like to ask, what's your knowledge about the bombing of those headers? What happened? Who reported those headers that were there? I want you to tell me about that because we've not really had your, your side to that. And I want to ask you, you about your local brigade that you set up. 
are they authorized now to carry arms? And what has been their effectiveness? You know, because when you launched, it was televised here on Arise TV. Those questions, sir. Thank you. I've not been able to reach out to Samusi, especially, you know, it is saying that once bitten, twice shy. If it were the video alone, it would have been a different thing. But signing a petition and releasing it to the media, I confirmed that it did not mean well for me. And that was why I had to respond to him through the media too. As far as I'm concerned, that was it. On the, um, the second question was what? The second question was about what really happened with the bombing of those headers. You know, was there a case of somebody reporting them who even availed the intelligence? What really happened? You, I want to hear your side you of know, that story. You know, I, as I told you, I visited my colleague before. So that question would have been better asked uh, to the governor of National State because I am the governor of Benue State. And I did not report anybody. I just heard about the bombing just like any other person. I was confused. I called my security advisor. And then a statement came from the defense headquarters. So I think if you want to verify this fact, it is the governor of Nasarawa State and the defense headquarters. They should be able to say that. I know nothing about this matter. And I keep saying my livestock guard or community volunteer guard were not involved in this matter. And of course, we don't carry unlawful weapons. Even the livestock guards that we have, that goes to your third question. They carry lawful weapons that are licensed. You will recall that some time ago, uh, because the Fulani headers go about with AK-47 killing people at will. And I decided that, let me try this. I know that it is not legal for uh, a community volunteer guards to carry arms or civilians to carry arms. But as a law-abiding government, what I simply did was to write to the presidency. The letter was there for three months and until I raised alarm again, and it was replied to me that it will not be right to issue licenses. You know, when you have bandits all over the place and nobody is making efforts to apprehend them and they are killing people every day, and as I talked to you, just three days ago, a DPO was killed, five people were murdered. There is no week that I don't lose up to 10 people. Since 2017, up to 6,000 people have been killed in the course of these herders coming in the name of rearing cattle, where their real agenda is taking over our land, killing people, sending them away. I have over 2 million IDPs that are suffering in the sun, in the rain, and are hungry. So this is the point that I am making, but I have never done anything illegal. And when I got a letter from the presidency, declining that we have no right to acquire AK-47 for our community volunteer guards. We are making do with what we have. What will you do with them, God? Okay, Governor. What will you do with them? action? Okay, yes. Governor Autumn. Well, there will be people watching you who will say that they are surprised, that you are surprised that 52 Fulani persons have written a petition to the president of Nigeria about you and your impressions about the uh, Fulani ethnic stock. Because you will recall that persistently you have always blamed the Fulani for trying to take over Nigeria. On one occasion, you accused the president himself that the president is being very partial to the Fulani people to take over Nigeria. On another occasion, when you were hosting members of the uh, G5, you also, uh, you know, uh, complained about the presidential candidate of the uh, PDP, and he kicked back, and he said you, you were profiling the Fulani as bandits and terrorists, and there was that controversy. And now, I guess the, this petition, you know, is a fallout of all of that. You know, and people say, 
you are very quick to profile people ethnically, Idoma people, thief people. Even on this program, you have mentioned Fulani people, you have mentioned Idoma people, you have mentioned the uh, TV people. Don't you think you are guilty as charged, even if nobody should seek to assassinate or eliminate anybody for expressing a point of view? Anyway, thank you very much, Ruben. Uh, how I wish you were in my shoes. And then you appreciate the challenges better. Am I the first person who I've talked about profiling people or the full anime? Have you not heard what the Sultan said sometime at banditry in Nigeria? Have you not heard what the governor of Katsina said before? Have you not heard what the Taraba governor said? Have you not seen what is happening in other parts of Nigeria? Am I the one saying it? But to show you that I am not against any ethnic group, I'm a chief man. And I preside over Idoma people here, Igede people, and other ethnic groups. But if they do wrong, I would say they have done wrong. I have just told you that the law prohibiting over uh, 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 open grazing and provision for ranching also provides that if anyone rustle livestock, he should be arrested and prosecuted. And two people have been arrested and prosecuted. It's not just the Fulani people. Here in Benu State, we live peacefully. We live with all ethnic groups, irrespective of where you come from. We live in peace with all. And I had an issue when the presidential candidate of PDP profiled me and said that he had big quarrel with me. I confronted him through a text as the presidential candidate of PDP. He apologized that that thing was not accurate. My only challenge with him, I replied to him that he needed to make the public also understand that he responded to me that the report that I read or I saw was not accurate. Because it was wrong for him to say that I provide only Fulani people. If the two people they do something wrong, I will say it. Me, I don't believe in uh, uh, calling white black yeah. and so on. So that is my own style. And so I am not against anyone. But if somebody does something that is wrong, it should be told. And if I do a one that is wrong, I should say it. I right, give you a typical example. You are going to give an example. I was going to give you a typical example. Out of anger in Makodi when G5 came. And arising from what uh, Vice President, the presidential candidate of APC, of the PDP said, I was angry, coupled with when my people in Benu said 38 indigenous people, farmers, were killed. And he loosely said they should learn to live. Uh, the the, the Benue people should learn to live with their neighbors because they pay tax. I was not happy with that. And I said, look, I am against a tiku. I will not work for a full animal. I think that was extreme. And I felt that that was a logical fallacy because it is not all Fulani people that are bad. There are good Fulani people that have contributed even in my personal life. And I have also contributed in adding value to their personal lives. Wow. So, when I, I discovered that I was out of anger, I went out of my way. I apologize to all Fulani. I apologize to Nigeria and to everyone who felt uh, not happy with what I said. So in this country, we must respect the rule of law. We must fight for justice, equity, and fairness. And where we are wrong, we should be able to come out boldly to say that we are wrong, so that things can work. All right. Thank you so very much, uh, the Governor of Benway State, Governor Samuel Autumn, for your time this morning. It's time for a short break now. When we return, Aaron Akerijola will be here with Global Sports Update. Stay with us.
Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months. It doesn't matter if you run a salary account with First Bank or any other bank. Just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First bank. There is a huge difference between the relative experience of salary earners and those of business owners and entrepreneurs. Someone who has never had cause to set up a business of his, who has never had cause to source for funds, turn it around, pay salaries, pay back the loan and still make profit, cannot be expected to be hands-on when saddled with an economy the size of Lagos. Experience that hasn't curbed Lagos's traffic in 24 years of their reign. Experience that hasn't addressed Lagos's perennial flood experience that currently leaves us with over 2 million out-of-school children. The duo of Jando and Funke have been investing in Lagos's economy for about two decades, running their personal businesses, employing people with track records of success. Lagos needs a breath of fresh air. Vote Dr. Abdulaziz Olajide Adidiron Jando as governor of Lagos State. PDP Power to, to the people. people! This is a different kind of energy. Yeah. That's Gen Gen Energy. With malt, ginseng, and vitamins. So recharge and take charge. Zag Energy Drink with malt. That's our kind of energy. Shallow I eat okay, make it relax like it's your by day. Anything you want to eat day on, if you do, I'm no need to delay. You don't need to stress yourself, eh? You got that world in your hand. Living like a baby girl for life, make the people know. If you wanna buy your head time, oh, yes. easy access now one time. Oh, yes. Everything break a day, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 oh yeah. My empty, oh, yeah. my empty, oh, yeah. my empty, my empty, Download my MTN NG app and get one gigabyte free. Also, get up to two gigabytes when you recharge 500 Naira and above with your debit card on the app. Plus, 10% extra on every recharge on my MTN NG app. There is only one place that the world will come to run on Saturday the 4th of February 2023. Over bridges, waterfronts, running across 10 kilometers and 42 kilometers of asphalt. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon will be targeting 100,000 runners from around the world, ready to flood the streets of Lagos. The 10-kilometer race will set off at 9.30 a.m. at the Grace Court Garden Events Place, Durasimi Eti, Lekki Face 1, while the 42-kilometer race will set off at 6.30 a.m. in front of the iconic National Stadium, Surulere. And both races will finish on top of the sandy shores of the stunning Echo Atlantic City. From Oshodi to Owuru, Alakbere to Admiralty, Ikoi to Echo Atlantic, the race is routed through the warm, meandering feet, blistering streets of this historic city. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to push beyond the limit. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon 2023. Make it count. At last.
last. The elections are here. Let's turn out en masse on election day and vote Ashua Yubola Tinubu as president of Nigeria for a renewed hope and a better Nigeria. Vote APC, the party that shows a broom. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. For updates on sports stories across the globe, Aaron Akere Jola joins us. Good morning, Aaron. How are you today? Yeah, very good morning to you. Ayo. Good morning to you, Doctor. Good morning to you, Rufai. And let's start it off with the news that has actually garnered mixed reactions, and that is the fact that charges against Mason Greenwood, of course, he was charged with attempted rape and assault, and all those charges have actually been dropped right now. And Manchester United have found themselves in a conundrum. They said they'll be having an internal meeting to decide what happens to this man and his future. Of course, he was arrested in January of 2022 after videos and images actually surfaced online of what actually transpired between him and his and his significant other then. So at the moment, all the charges have been dropped, but what happens to him and his future at Manchester United is left to be seen. As a lot of people have actually come for those that have probably tried to lend some kind of support to Mason Greenwood at the moment. It looks like a pariah at the moment. And let's see how it goes. Manchester United are facing a huge decision, and they are starting to be a huge decision. Let's see what happens between now and the weekend. And put it into context, a ma former Manchester United player, Popoba also is in the mix. Juventus are thinking and actually considering and exploring options of terminating his contract because they are saying that 27 games have been played by the old lady this season. Popoba has not featured in any. And not because he's been out injured, but they say that he has been complicit in all the drama that has actually surrounded his injury. They've paid him as of December 2022. Juventus had paid him £2.9 million and he's yet to kick a ball. And he's actually earning a whole lot more coming into 2023. And they are saying that when they told him to go for surgery, he refused to go for surgery. And ultimately, because he was thinking about going to the World Cup, then a video now surfaced of him trying to go skiing in the Alps. And they're saying that you claim to have an injury and we are seeing you in the Alps. And he claims they were all photo ops. It didn't, um, nothing like that actually surfaced. And videos always surface of him dancing, gyrating, and they are asking questions. We need you now more than ever before. We are paying you an arm and a leg, and yet you're refusing to put in the work to ensure that you represent the club. Well, let's see actually what happens. Quickly, Real Madrid um, closed the gap in the Spanish Premier Division by beating Valencia two goals to one yesterday. And this weekend, of course, talking about some of the fixtures in the Premier League and other, fi other leagues, I must tell you that it is very, very massive. Arsenal do have a very, very stern test this weekend when you look at things as they actually travel to play Everton. All right. And when you and other fixtures actually include Tottenham also playing Manchester City this weekend. And more importantly, looking at the Premier League table, um, looking at the Premier League fixture, if they can actually help us with that, and some other fixtures. Of course, uh, not putting into context Manchester United against Crystal Palace, Inter Milan against AC Milan, and uh, Tottenham against Manchester City. Of course, Chelsea against Fulham. Um, the derby is going to be happening today, West London derby. So let's see how we actually play it out. Oh, um, um, 9 p.m. tonight. So let's see how things play out today. And the rivalry continues. West Ham in rich vein of form and. Chelsea will be hoping that all the new signings can actually begin to bear fruit. And quickly, 
Tomorrow, the eighth edition of the Access Bank Lagos City Marathon will be held here in Lagos, and everyone seems to be hyped about it. Um, athletes are already on ground for this particular race, and as usual, governors and deputy governors will also be present at this race, talking about um, the governor of Lagos State, Baba Didi who will be running also tomorrow, and not forgetting a man that has always made it, and I think he's the fittest deputy governor, or maybe the fittest official right now, talking about no other than Honorable Philip Shaibo. He ran the entire kilometers in Okwekwe, and I'm sure he did 43 last, uh, last year. I'm sure he'll be doing more this year. And finally, tomorrow also, the Sportsville Award will be, uh, will be taking place here in Lagos State, and several sporting dignitaries and sporting personalities will be celebrated. Over to you, Dr. Number, offense, number yes. one, the uh, issue about missing Greenwood. Yes. Whatever happens at the end of the day, they caught the, uh, the prosecution, uh, you know, uh, counsel says they've dropped charges, charges against yeah. him mm -hmm. because witnesses refused to show up. Mm -hmm. Then additional information was procured. What that additional information is, nobody has disclosed. That is what, uh, you know, the uh, prosecution has told us. Now, it will be unfortunate, you know, because this could damage his career, a career that has not even started. So 21 years of age. The, uh, the uh, fans mm. of Manchester United, they are saying they don't want him back because there is a bigger issue in the matter about violence against women. Yes. The big issue in the room, whether the court has decided or not, or has dropped charges or not, the issue is about violence against women. Privileged men thinking that they have a sense of entitlement over the anatomy of a female homo sapien, you know, <laughs> in whatever circumstance. <laughs> but, but why, okay. you know, uh, Green, uh, uh, why Mason Wood may have been uh, given, uh, Greenwood, Mason Greenwood may have been given uh, some the, kind of reprieve yeah. by the court. Negri Grigios, okay. the world number 20 in tennis is not so lucky. He appeared in Canberra in court this morning. He too wanted his charges to be dropped, and he was pleading mental health. And the court said, no, you have, you have cases, you have a case to answer for assaulting a female homo sapien. And so this is why the lesson is important about violence against women. Mm. No, but the point is, the good thing about Grigios' case is yes. that even though he pled guilty, He's been, he's been, he's, he's going to avoid any kind of conviction. Some are saying that. We don't is, know he get, yet. is he getting I'm a slap on the wrist? I'm telling you what the court decided this morning. So, I'm giving, so, so this is from an eye ago. This is just from an eye ago. And, and because I have been following the case. So he too is falling into that particular category you just mentioned about privileged men getting. Let, let, let me say this real quickly. Yes. I fear so much for this man's career. I think he's as good as done. I don't think any club, I might be wrong, the caveat. I don't think any club would touch Missing Greenwood again. No, but if Chad Evans could get a club. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me you just talk about female uh, violence yes, he did, against, but he ultimately got mm -hmm. a club. violence against women in sports. Uh, yes. Recently, the FA in England came under fire for safeguarding issues, asking Villa female coach assaulting female players. Investigation still ongoing. And just to highlight that, that even in female um, sports, female football, it is a big issue. Anyway. Uh, Aaron will have mm. to go now. So as it is, even your own segment has timed out. <laughs> 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 we we'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to Olufun Shodohati, governorship candidate of the Action Democratic Congress, ADC, in Lagos. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Say no to malaria. Yes to life. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband Mega Offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. 
reliable home broadband box. Airtel, the smartphone network. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. The candidate of the African Democratic Congress, ADC in Lagos State, Olufunsho Doherty, has vowed to disentangle Alpha Beta Consulting, a tax company in the state. The former managing director and chief executive officer of Pensions Alliance Limited says he will reform public service if elected as the governor of Lagos State and that his administration will address the chaotic traffic situation in the state and reduce regulation and tax burden on small businesses and low income earners. Also invest in building quality education and health sectors. Joining us now on the show to talk about his governorship vision for Lagos State is Olufunsho Doherty, governorship candidate of the Action Democratic Con Congress ADC. Good morning, Mr. Doherty. Good morning. And welcome African to the morning Democratic show. Congress. Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Thank, you Thank you very morning. much for joining us. Thank you. You were Thank most you. recently on the platform of the platform. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Where you raised uh, yes. some of these uh, issues. Now, one of the things you talked about is the lack of transparent leadership yes. in the BAME, yes. the Nigerian development process. So are you saying there's lack of transparent leadership in Lagos State? I would need you to link some of those issues to the specific case of Lagos State. And secondly, what you intend to do about traffic situation okay. in Lagos? Because the incumbent administration says as part of, uh, you know, um, the Tinobu legacy, yeah. they have a transportation master plan working on waterways, uh, you know, they've done uh, the light rail project, they are talking about the fourth uh, mainland bridge and all that. Do you have issues with, you know, the, that master plan? You see, that master plan is not good enough. If you win, you just shove it aside. Okay, thank you. And, and good morning again. And, and by the way, congratulations on the 10th anniversary of, of Arise. Uh, you guys have done it. Um, so, uh, I think that uh, clearly what we are saying is that transparency in Lagos can be a lot better. Um, we think that um, this, the uh, activities of the state, the activities of government, the uh, projects that government undertakes, the engagement of government with the private sector in areas like uh, public-private partnerships, etc., can be much more transparently administered and we can have a lot more in the public domain than we currently do. Um, and if you take, for example, one of the things we talked about, the, light, the, the, light, the blue, blue Line Rail Project, for example, this is a project that started with a time frame of four years. We are 14 years down the road. It's not clear why it has taken so long, what the costs of, of that um, engagement uh, are, uh, and why we have had that both time and cost overrun. And we think that these are things that, are, that ought to be in the public domain. Uh, and I have said that when we come, one of the things that we will do is we'll open up that project and put the information in the public domain. Uh, even if you take things like the, admi I think it's a culture, actually, if you ask me. If you take things like the administration of, the tax administration of the state. So if you take the alpha beta arrangement that we have, for example, this is a private company. 
closely held, not clear what the ownership of the company is, collecting a share of the tax revenues of the state for an extended period of time. These are things that ought to be, first of all, it ought not to be. Uh, and if we have such an engagement with a private entity, it should be very clear who the state is dealing with and who is uh, benefiting from those uh, activities uh, on behalf of the people of Lagos State. Um, so that's one. And the second okay. half of your question had to do with, remind me. Transportation. Transportation. So, um, look, the truth of the matter is that at the end of the day, we measure things by their outcomes. Right? So it is not enough to say that you have expended so much or that you have spent so much or that you say that you have commissioned a light rail project 14 years after and it's not operational, you're just commissioning it. When we look at the outcome, the reality, the fact of the matter is that people are still spending four, five hours in traffic in Lagos on a daily basis. And we, may, we must measure by outcomes, not by input or effort. That is how you, that's the yardstick by which you measure, measure government. And I think that we can pay, say, pay lip service to what we are doing on the waterways, what we are doing on rail, what we are doing on the roads, but at the end of the day, the experience of the people is the experience of the people. Yeah. And it leaves a lot to be desired. All right. They the Fort Mainland Bridge. They've gone far with it by March. They're going to... Uh, award the uh, uh, contract. You already have a preferred bidder. You already have three companies lined up. So if you win, you will cancel the Fort Mainland Bridge? Uh, no, I've not said we'll cancel it. I've said we'll halt it. I will undertake a review of the project from two perspectives. One is to even understand whether in the light of the transit uh, issues that we're dealing with in Lagos State, that is the best use of $2.5 billion, right? Um, um, for a project which is supposed to take four years. The previous one, which was supposed to take four years, took 14. And up till today, we don't know how much it costs. So we said we will stop it first, review it, determine whether it is at the appropriate uh, use of those resources and the appropriate uh, solution to provide at this time. And then, um, and then, and then we'll take a decision. Um, again, you know, I think that this is a project that is a huge public works project. It's under, being undertaken under a PPP arrangement. It's not enough to come out and say, you know, we, have, we had bidders and we've reduced it to the three bidders and we've chosen a preferred bidder. That whole process should be in the public domain. We should know the entire process. And ultimately, even the terms of the PPP should be in the public domain because it's on behalf of the people of Lagos. And $2.5 billion is an incredible amount of money. Even for a state like Lagos, it's almost 2 trillion naira. Our annual budget for a whole year is about 1.7 trillion, inclusive of 500 billion that we borrow, by the way. So it is not trivial. And you are committing people to a large expenditure for an extended period of time on one public works project. So it should be out there. All right. So, so talking about transport, another big menace which you addressed at the platform yes. that's um, plaguing the city of Lagos is Taos, popularly referred to as Agbe Yes. In fact, in your statement, you said that they've become a part of the political structure in Lagos State. Yes. And therefore, there's no political will yes. to do away with them. And so over the years, despite promises or um, asking for a deal, you know, to tackle this situation, mm. the governors haven't been able to do it. Yes. What would be your solution to reading um, perhaps, or putting them to better use, to, to make them more productive, for these young people who are on our roads as touts, popularly called as agbiris? Okay, so um, I think the first thing to realize is that to make a dent in the problem, you have to have, again, the political will. So the first thing, and the freedom to make that decision. But if you are, if they're a large part of the, 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 the um, electorate that puts you in power, then you're gonna be hamstrung in that effort. And we, if we come to power, we'll come to power on the, on the support of the people, and so we'll not have that constraint. And so we can act. Now, beyond that, if you look at the, um, the dynamics of the agro structure, basically what you have is like a pyramidal organization, right? Um, and essentially you have a lot of foot soldiers, right? And then you have a flow of resources, right, to a, to a few people within that, um, at the top of that pyramid. Some of those resources, it's not clear where all of those resources are going. Some may be uh, government levies. Many may be levies that are ending up in private pockets. And we are saying that you need to come in there first. Uh, first of all, put, a, um, put, put some order 
around what they are doing. So for example, this chasing of people on the highways, you can stop that first and say that those levies should not be collected on the highways, right? Then uh, secondly, the, um, the, the, what you want to do is to ensure that those foot soldiers have an alternative means of livelihood, right? And you can even put in place a, a short-term solution that replaces that revenue, that income, right? You will be surprised that most of those food soldiers, when you look at the amount of money that is flowing through the system, the amount that is being shared among those food soldiers is probably a very small part of the money. And most of the money is the money that ends up. And that's how this pyramidal organization works. It's the same way criminal organizations work. It's the same way when you have this pyramidal structure. Most of the money flows into a few pockets. And the food soldiers, who are the vast majority of the people, really have peanuts. So it's actually not, it actually does not cost a whole lot to replace those incomes at the bottom of the pyramid and take care of a lot of people. And then over time, you can then integrate them into other forms. And we've talked about things like our educational system, our plans for that system, vocational education, technical education, sports. These are all things where you can bring in people who have fallen out of the mainstream. And you can even do it in an adult education context. And again, this is consistent also with our plan for the commercial part of Lagos, right? Because if you think about Lagos, and I made this point, Lagos is a city that's a port city. It's on the coast. We have a large population by the coast. So it's a natural draw for anybody who is looking to establish a business to serve that, um, um, to serve that, um, that market and also to be a base for export. But to do that, in scale, you basically need a skilled workforce, right? Because that's what those people look for. They look for the geographic advantages that we have, working infrastructure, and a skilled workforce, right? So we think that this, again, and uh, this whole agro situation also ties into that broader, um, you know, integrated plan that we have for Lagos, such that Lagos then becomes an attractive destination because it has all of these components, right? together with a supportive government, which we will be, to enable business and, um, mm -hmm. and drive prosperity. You talked about Alpha Beta. How are you going to tackle it? Knowing fully well that it's been codified in law, it's gone through the National Assembly. What will be you, you know, your plan to be able to get it out of the way, like you said you'll do? Secondly, I want you to talk about flooding, which is mm -hmm. a very big problem that is happening. Also, you know, do you think Lagos needs a, a social safety net? Because there's a massive level of unemployment now by many economic factors in the state. So it is riddled with two million out-of-school children, but also a lot of very poor people, despite the fact that it is looked at as a center of affluence. Mm -hmm. um, so Alpha Beta. Um, yes, there's, there's probably a contract, right? And we'll look at all the details of the contract. There's no contract that is an, a forever and ever contract. Right? So there must be conditions under which contracts can be terminated. Even if those are provisions are not in the contract, we need to understand the basis for the contract, who the beneficiaries of the contract, etc., are. And even if there's a contract and those underlying bases are inconsistent with the public trust in which, under which those um, serving public officers were when they signed those contracts, we can actually uh, take action that says that the basis of this contract is flawed, and therefore we think it should be vitiated. So we'll go into that, and ultimately, we believe that, you know, we will take whatever legal processes we need to. In other words, we will not, we will not act um, outside of the How law. How do you deal with the national, uh, the State House of Assembly? Um, it's, this is a contract that the executive has signed. It's a contract that the executive has signed, and we're looking at it, and looking at this contract, and looking at the people of Lagos, and saying, is this contract in public interest? And if there are actions that the Attorney General's office needs to take, the Department of Public Prosecutions, we'll take those actions. So the main thing is the will, and divorcing the interests of the beneficiaries of that contract from the interests of government and the people of Lagos. And we will do that once we come in. Okay. The second question had to do with flooding. Mm. And um, <clears throat> this is a perennial problem. I think that it is something that we, as the managers of Lagos, must have front and center in our minds. When we define infrastructure, and I've spoken about our Tiger Agenda, which you all may be familiar with. The I in our Tiger Agenda is infrastructure to support a modern megacity. 
when we define infrastructure, one of the things that we define as infrastructure is the environmental infrastructure, which has to do with water, water control, flooding, wetlands, etc., channelization, and so on. So you need to ensure that as, as a state, you have a roadmap and a, a long-range plan around this. And by the way, there's global warming. So that problem is not going to get, it's not going to get less, it's going to get more. So we need to be planning proactively ahead and building the infrastructure to, uh, to ensure that the, the whatever flooding will be occasioned by that is adequately planned for and we invest resources to, to make that happen. So it will not be very different actually from the approach that we take to infrastructure in all the other areas. We'll just do you have a specific plan for flooding? You know, how are you going to evacuate these waters? What are you going to do? That is a, a relief mechanism yeah. and things like that? No, no, that's a technical... Uh, it, that, what you've just asked is a technical question. What I'm saying is that the way you get to a solution that works, and I'm not an engineer, the way you get to a technical solution that works is to understand the problem, define it at the appropriate level. In other words, this is an infrastructure problem, and you that's must build the infrastructure to support it so that you are not in a reactive mode each time there's a flooding season because you know it's flooding is going to come. Does it need a safety net? The state need a safety net with all of the economy? So to me, I think that ultimately, ultimately a state like Lagos should have a supportive mechanism for its most vulnerable citizens. I believe so. If you look at the T in our Tiger agenda, it says tax reform for equity, prosperity and growth. And what are, what are we saying there? One of the things we're saying is that, look, your tax system, which is your whole system of fiscal uh, interaction with your people around uh, finances and what you take from them and what you give to them, must be such that the people who earn the most are paying the most, the people who earn the least are paying the least, and the people who need help, right, and the reduced burden of taxes and perhaps social support. When you get the economy to a sufficient degree of prosperity, you can do more with respect to those redistributive mechanisms. So I would be supportive of that. I will be supportive of reducing the tax burden as the first instance on the, on the, on the um, most vulnerable, lowest cadre. And by the way, what we have in Lagos is almost a regressive tax system. When you think about both the formal and the informal taxes and levies that people pay. So we think about the normal taxes that people pay in the LIRS and so on. But everybody, whether they are street traders, whether they are commercial bus drivers and so on, they pay levies on a daily basis. If you total these levies, you might find that their effective tax rate is substantially higher than yours and mine, right? They may be paying tax, a tax rate of 40, 50 percent. And okay. we, need, we say this does not need to happen. We can get rid of it. We have limited time. Sure. Two things. Yes, sir. You are running for the position of governor in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. We someone mentioned in, uh, uh, I think, Calabar recently. Oh, no, is it to you? He said that he is his backyard. <laughs> the man who has been labeled the father of modern Lagos. Yes. The city boy yes. of Lagos. Yes. Who at the same time is the presidential candidate of the ruling party of the country. Yes. And he has a sitting governor who has been told would uh, do a second term by the grace of the, uh, of the godfather. Yes. How strong is your level of optimism? That's one. Two. Heineck has said, look, most uh, voters, accredited voters in Lagos State, many of them have not uh, collected their PVCs. Mm. So do you have any strategy to mobilize people to turn out on election day? Mm. Because that can make a difference. Yes. But if people don't have their PVCs, they won't come out. Thank you. Um, great questions. Um, so my level of optimism is very high. And what is it based? You outlined a, a set of factors. Uh, you know, incumbent, Calabar, Lion of Bodylon, and so on and so forth. By the way, remember that our agenda is Tiger agenda. So this is Tiger versus Lion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> the Tiger, we are. Is yeah, your, yeah, the Tiger agenda is our We are on the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you Lion from uh, Isaliko <laughs> or from uh, Campus Square? <laughs> okay, the Tiger of Campus Square versus the Lion of Bodylon. <laughs> That would be interesting to see. Um, so, but, but on the other side is the people of Lagos. The people of Lagos. And no matter how powerful a centralized group that has had control of the state for 25 years can be, it, it, they can never be more powerful than the people of Lagos if they express their will in a particular direction. And we are saying 
in our engagement with the people of Lagos, and we have been across Lagos, and even tomorrow I will be in Shomolu, Bariga, local government. Everywhere we go, people are of the view that their lives are the way they are because of the leadership that they have. They recognize it. And I'm talking not just of the elite. I'm talking about the people in the markets. I'm talking about the people in the mechanic villages. And so I'm very optimistic about 2023. As you can see, there's a greater level of awareness amongst all cadres. They talk about the youth, but I found, I found it amongst the older people. I found it amongst the lower socioeconomic category, etc. People are very clear that they want something different. They want a leadership that will act in their interest, and that's the message that we bring. Um, and we expect that 2023 will be very different from prior years. One of the things that people have asked is that their votes likely to count in 2023 because they've had this concern in the past that, you know, people tell us when we're walking through the, the, the market, they say, look, there's no problem about voting. We are going to vote. But you just make sure that our votes count. That's what they tell us. Okay. And in 2023, we believe they will. You asked a question about PVC. About very quickly. Turnout, yes. yeah. Briefly. Um, very briefly, I think that we are all making um, representations to INEC to improve their capacity to, to deal with this problem. I, I actually, unlike many people, think INEC is doing a reasonably good job. I'm quite supportive of that. I think they have an enormous challenge. Um, but I think we just need to keep making the case. And then, and then on the demand side, ensuring that people do not relent in their efforts to ensure that they obtain those things. And we just have to support them in that process. And I think we will. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Doherty, uh, gubernatorial candidate in Lagos State of the African Democratic Congress, ADC. We wish you all the best. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be talking to Professor Chris Imumolen, the presidential candidate of the Accord Party in the 2023 general elections. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Adjust to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. us today and let us take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. My daughter-in-law, so how are you planning for my son's birthday? No, 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 no. You have to cook up for her. Do your people have a greasy there? No. It's okay. Okay, let me call you back. Mama Chiji, okay. Hi, so wait a market. Please pack some Ogirisi. Achi, Opo, Azumbasa. I am going to visit my son. <laughs> my daughter in law. It's arranged. But you must use original red oil to prepare the soup. What? It's very scarce. I'll call you back. <laughs> Mama Chiji, please include Isio Oroko. <laughs> my daughter in law. Everything is now set. But don't forget that gold wristwatch I saw the last time I visited you. With 11 copper per second calls to all networks, the only thing you've run out of are things to say. Get a glow sim or dial star 777 hash now. That's silk bubble.
juice and all the goodness that comes in it. Think Chivita, specially made for you. And there is more to choose from. Whatever your preferences are, there is a Chivita for you. Oh, ah. Yes. <laughs> Check out our new Chivita Smart Malt Drink. So, what's your Chivita? There is a huge difference between the relative experience of salary earners and those of business owners and entrepreneurs. Someone who has never had cause to set up a business of his, who has never had cause to source for funds, turn it around, pay salaries, pay back the loan and still make profit, cannot be expected to be hands-on when saddled with an economy the size of Lagos. Experience that hasn't curbed Lagos' traffic in 24 years of their reign. Experience that hasn't addressed Lagos' perennial flood. Experience that currently leaves us with over 2 million out-of-school children. The duo of Jando and Funke have been investing in Lagos' economy for about two decades, running their personal businesses, employing people with track records of success. Lagos needs a breath of fresh air. Vote Dr. Abdulaziz Olajide Adediron Jando as governor of Lagos State. PDP Power to, to the, the people. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. At 39, Professor Chris Imumole, the presidential candidate of the Accord Party, is the youngest presidential candidate in the 2023 general election in Nigeria scheduled for this month. Running on the Accord Party platform, Professor Imumole is a candidate with no baggage or track record of failure. The 39-year-old candidacy offers a new paradigm in Nigerian election. With a campaign promising civil service reforms, increasing budgetary allocation to education, completing abandoned projects across the country, protecting Nigeria's borders, reforming health and social welfare, and mounting an institutional war against corruption, Professor Mumalan has centered some of the big issues. However, with no sitting governor in any of the 36 states in Nigeria, critics are of the opinion that Accord Party flag bearer may likely not measure up to the dominant parties of APC, PDP and the growing strength of Labour Party and the NNPP. Joining us now to share his vision and ideas on why he is the best candidate for the top job in Nigeria is Professor Christopher Imomolen presidential candidate of Accord Party. Good morning, Professor, and welcome to The Morning Show. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. But first, before we begin to talk about other issues, let's start with KYC. Because most people will say, well, in terms of name recognition, um, they don't know the presidential candidate of Accord Party. Mm -hmm. We've said it before on this program, that there are 18 presidential candidates, mm -hmm. but we just know about four of them mostly in the public domain. So KYC, uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, Google says you have three master's degrees, you have two PhD degrees, uh, you are a professor, you are also the adult of Abaji, 
you are from Ekpoma, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, East and West yeah. local government area of uh, Edosi. If you could just take us through your background and why you think you are the best man for the job. And professor, are you a professor of education or of engineering? Where? And, you know, okay. what you've been doing? Yeah, thank you. My name is Professor Christopher Imumolen. I'm 39 years. I'll be 40 this year, September. So um, I am I, I'm an educationalist. I started my career in the educational sector where we founded the Joint Professional Training and Support Institute. Um, after then, we moved on to establishing universities. I am also the vice chancellor of Global World University in Togo and Ghana. And um, you know, we started wanting to establish a university in Nigeria here, yeah. but the bureaucracy of getting a university license um, actually was one of those things that actually um, gave us the opportunity to start seeing other countries privately. Um, I have my two masters, one from University of Lagos, I have masters in Material Meteorological Engineering, University of Lagos, and I have another master from the South Amazon University, it's an online school in Costa Rica. I also have my PhD and um, my PhD from Togo, that is Global Wealth University, which was the International University for Management and Technology. And um, I've been in academia over the years. I've also ventured into um, oil and gas. I was the president on shore of shore oil and gas professionals. And um, because of our humanitarian work, I also badged the um, title of Adu of Abaji. You know, we, we founded Unique Foundation, which basically was to support um, the less privileged in the community out there. We've been doing that for the last 10 years, how to support women, men, youth, provide grants for businesses. Um, we've done the little we can in seeing how we can uplift the life of Nigerians privately. Also, we also venture into seeing how we can also provide scholarship for Nigerians to study um, in Nigeria and outside of Nigeria. Because as an educationist, as one who also find it very difficult to badge a first degree, my first degree was um, I did my mechanical engineering at the University of Benin, um, Ubawa campus, and um, that was where I had my first degree. And it was very difficult for me, having lost my father at the age of 12, and getting a first degree was difficult. Eventually, God helped us, and I said, how do we give back to society? So we launched the scholarship trust fund, and ever since we've been trying to see how do we support Nigerians having access to quality, affordable, and accessible education. That has helped us to also spread our tentacle beyond Nigeria to other West African countries, seeing how we can also. I believe that education remains one of the keys to driving national development for Nigeria and Africa. Yeah. So we have um, invested in that um, hugely. Married, I'm from Ekboma, from Mission West, from Island community okay. in Ekboma. I was born and bred in Lagos in Mushi, Idioro. I was born, I had my secondary school, and program in Nigeria model um, secondary school in Idioro, Lagos. So, no, you are you. not from Mushi, you are from Mushi. <laughs> Mushi. <laughs> okay, thank well, you. thank you for detailing. I, yeah. I think I'm sure Nigerians have gotten to know you a bit better, which is great. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I hear a lot of education in your background, and you have also even campaigned on the strength of education, mm -hmm. talking about how you would, you know, really allocate more funds, funding to the education sector in Nigeria. But beyond education, what, what presents to the next president of Nigeria is economy. We have, you know, the state of economy. We have the debt of potential 77 trillion naira. We have uh, health care. We have, you know, poverty levels. What are some of your ideas in tackling these issues if you were to emerge president? Yeah, for me, I have looked critically into the Nigerian challenges, and one out of many is the value system. The value system by itself has affected the kind of leaders that we also chunk out to actually govern Nigeria. We have uh, many Nigerians whose um, value system has been prioritized into something else. And that go back to the kind of educational system we have Education is not just what you learn in classroom. It boils down to what you learn informally, formal education and non-formal education. As an educationist, I know that our mind as Nigeria needs to be reformed. We need to begin to look at what Nigeria imbibes, what we believe, what we do, daily activities. How do we train our children? How do we make sure that Nigerians become Nigerians that can lead Nigeria and take Nigeria to the next destination? 
is very key for us about the Nigeria itself is the biggest challenge. Once you're able to have Nigerians whose mind is focused on solving Nigeria's problem, who prioritize the right value system, look at homes from the family structure. You can see even parents now, you can see. I'm from that system. So how, how, does it, how do you tackle the economy with that? You know, just to be more specific, specific uh, responses. So in terms of the economy, in, in inflation rate, um, how do you go the GDP? How do you manage that beyond the family unit? Yeah, one, we have an issue. We have an issue of the economy, which, of course, um, by the grace of God, if I become the president of Nigeria, would um, quickly be looking at it because these are issues that must be looked at. One, and um, we talked about the issue of um, the unemployment in Nigeria itself, which is a function of how bad our economy has done. You know, how do we quickly ensure that our youths are, one, to me, it's a policy issue. You know, when I spoke about we going out of Nigeria to set up university, it tells you how hard a Nigerian survive in doing business in Nigeria. It's a policy issue. We need to begin to open our economy. We need to begin to liberalize so many sectors that have been wrong, that have been monopolized by few people. And that, again, is what we'll be doing. How do we open up the power sector? No economy can strive without power itself. How do we liberalize? I've said it in my manifesto. One of the first, very first things we do is to see how to disbond the National Electric Regulatory Commission and begin to give access and, power and ensure that we have more investors who can run, we have people who can actually run our economy. Government should pay less attention in doing business rather than um, was providing opportunities for business to strive. We we'll begin to look at how do we create an enabling environment for us to have a Nigerian that is, that is run by private sector. We need an economy that is private sector driven. And that can only happen when you open up your economy, you allow investors to come in, you allow Nigerians who are the first investor to begin to have confidence in investing in Nigeria. There's a lot of bad policies that we have that will not allow. I am an investor. I've invested hugely in Nigeria economy itself. So I know what it takes okay. to run a business in Nigeria. Okay. So by so doing, changing our policy, having a, a friendly policy for Nigerians to run, I believe we have a better economy. Right. Okay. All of this can be successful without security. Mm. If you were elected president today, what are the top three things you'll do to solve the lingering insecurity problem? in the country with practical approach and steps. Secondly, I was stating yesterday that between 2015 to now, we've got over 600 naira added on the value of the parity between the naira and the dollar. What would you do and what are the mechanism, economic mechanisms you put in place for this burgeoning exchange rate debacle we have? Practical steps, please. Yeah. Number one, the security challenge. We must begin to solve the issue of the national disintegration. For the first time, what I mean that is many Nigerians do not feel as part of Nigerians because of the kind of leadership system we've had over time. I'm going to run an all-inclusive government. I will bring everybody on board. We'll discuss Nigeria, the Nigerian constitution again in a way that every Nigeria will feel as Nigeria in Nigeria. It's very key. Because when people don't feel as part of Nigerians, there will be a lot of sabotage. We have a lot of sabotage and sabotage, making sure that Nigeria is not safe. Secondly, the issue of border. I've made my research. I've visited a lot of borders in Kestina and some other places. I've noticed that we have over 1,400 1, unmanned illegal routes into Nigeria. A country that is not properly manned has its national sovereignty in question. We must begin to ensure that all our borders are manned. It's very key. Then thirdly, we must begin to run Nigeria security with artificial intelligence. We have so much human intelligence. The world have gone tech digital. We must begin to ensure that our security persons are encouraged. One, about security itself, crime does not happen except two things happen. One is the desire to commit crime. Second is the opportunity to commit crime. When a man who is desires to commit crime meets the opportunity to commit crime, such a person, there will be crime. So we must, it's, the gov, it's the government's responsibility to ensure that that opportunity is not there. But God is the only one that stops a man who desires from not desiring. So is that contract. your practical approach to solving the yes. security problem? Yes. One, national, bringing back Nigerians together on one table. Two, looking at our border porosity. Three, using technology, hugely invest in technology. And there are other things also. We need to ensure that our security men are also motivated, trained, retrained, and given all that it takes to fight insecurity. In so what the, the, the exchange rate that I talked about, what are your practical steps to coming out of that? 
Yes, one is um, we cannot, if or, like, the way Nigeria is, our dependency on foreign goods, our dependency as a, 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 a consuming economy as this, everything we need, about 70% of what we need, even as a manufacturer, you have to bring them in. So we stress our foreign exchange reserve, we stress our, like, we need so much. What I feel, what we must do, is what the present government was trying to do, but they didn't do it right, is to begin to ensure that Nigerians by Nigerians are encouraged to do business in Nigeria. I talked about policy issue. How do we fix our power problem immediately? We still run a government till today that we have not been able to generate more than 6,000 megawatts of power. I know of a company, just one company in India, owned by Mukesh Abani, produces 36,000 megawatts of power, just a single company in India. Oh. What? Yeah. yeah. You can, yeah. So we must, we must solve, um, what's it called? Uh, we must begin to provide um, things that are needed for business to strive in Nigeria. Until we do that, believe me, the need, and we have a very big population, this, our stress on dollar, and again, we talked about Nigerians in diaspora, collection of remittance is also key. It must be harmonized. It must be done in a way that is transparent and is open. So that that's, to, that's right, again. I hear your point. You too, you want to move Nigeria from consumption, to production. <laughs> of course. You'll be right to say that. Yes. Okay, very quickly. There, there is an issue that came up this morning on this program. That's the Naira redesign policy. And this for all air, you know, over new uh, notes. Mm. Now, we're saying that it's only the APC that is complaining. Mm. Presidential candidate of the APC, the interim spokesman for the campaign, uh, Nasi El Rufai, even as we speak, some governors of the APC are arriving at the presidential villa mm. to have a conversation with the uh, president over these uh, new notes. What's your own take? I mean, I mean, it would be nice to hear from another presidential candidate yeah. out of the 18. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a good policy that is um, implemented in a wrong way. That is my one, it's good because. Um, we're looking at the election. Everybody that understands what is happening understands the purpose of it. However, it has a very wrong policy, wrong impact on the economy, as well at this time. Look at what is happening in the city, let alone in the rural community, where the level of digital transaction has, has gotten nowhere. I receive calls from the village, from everywhere, telling us daily of the stress. So, this is it. I believe that the policy by itself. Is an APC policy to check made APC by themselves. That is why we see all this opera around them. And for candidates like us, it's good because we now have more confidence that vote buying and the rest of these things that they normally do would reduce to a large extent. So we believe that God is working out good for us. I mean, candidates like us in a court party who, before the election, we we were thinking, oh, how do we how do we ensure that we get our vote and our vote counted? It's a good policy for election, but bad for the economy. Well, on that note, we'd like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Mumulen, presidential candidate of the Accord Party. We'll take a short break now. When we return, Ojini Kaupe will be here with details on what's trending. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The community of persons with disabilities is set to participate in the 2023 general elections and beyond. The Independent National Electoral Commission, in partnership with TAF Africa, is ready to drive inclusion of persons with disabilities in the electoral process. Different disability clusters will have access to various assistive electoral materials, magnifying glasses for persons with albinism, braille ballot guide for the blind, residual limb voting for persons with leprosy and bilateral amputees, election day written instructions for the deaf and priority voting for all persons with disabilities. These resources are in line with provisions of Section 54, Subsection 1 and 2 of the Electoral Act 2022. Come out on Election Day and exercise your civic rights. This message is brought to you by TAF Africa and funded by the European Union through its support to democratic governments in Nigeria. Join our Able to Vote Guide Micro Series, same time, same station, as well as on all our social media platforms. TAF Africa, Disability Inclusion Champion. 
Imagine your wallet can be everything. Well, almost everything your bank is to you. That's exactly what First Money Wallet is. First Money Wallet from First Bank is another swift and seamless way to bank from your mobile phone. It doesn't matter if you have a First Bank account or not, nor the mobile network you use. Everyone can open a First Money Wallet and it's very easy. Your phone number is your account number. With First Money Wallet, you can send money using just a phone number, receive money, pay bills, buy airtime and data for yourself or someone else and in check balance you don't need a bank account at all or BVN to enjoy the boundless possibilities First Money Wallet offers. All you need is a registered phone number and you can fund your wallet easily through your First Bank account or any bank account and debit card. What's more, First Money Wallet is highly secure with fingerprint technology and PIN and when you need cash, just walk up to any First Money agent near you to withdraw money. No smartphone, no wahala. Just dial star 8 nine four star one hash on any phone so it doesn't matter if you live in the city or the remotest part of the country with first money wallet your transactions are easy seamless and secure download the first money wallet app now input your phone number and follow the prompts or simply dial star eight nine four star one hash all money now on first money you first first bank As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. My name is Kashim Shetima. I'm an agricultural economist by training, a banker by profession, and now a public servant by calling. I was the governor of Borno State for eight years. In the heat of the Boko Haram, we set up an agricultural transformation committee. We crisscrossed the wall and invested in the whole agricultural value chain. Lagos is the smallest state in Nigeria in terms of landmass, 3,577 square kilometers. But the largest rice mill in Africa and the third largest in the world is located in Imota in Lagos. That is the power of ideas. Bola Tinubu is an idea whose time has come. Let us vote for Bola Tinubu to be the president of Nigeria come 25th of February. God bless Nigeria. to remember in the history of our dear country Nigeria. Nine wise men from the north who are governors came together on June 8th, 2022 to stand for equity and fairness in the interests of our nation Nigeria. They buried personal interests for the unity of our country. They supported the call that power must shift to the south in 2023. They chose a Nigeria agenda. We salute our brothers and sisters in the northern part of this country who in spite of their vote advantage continue to propagate 
the unity of Nigeria by promoting rotational presidency between the north and southern part of the country. Let voters in the north follow the move by these leaders. Vote for power shift to the south. It's the turn of the south to produce the president in 2023. Let's vote Wala Tinubu for president for a renewed hope of better Nigeria. Vote Kashim Shetima as vice president. Vote APC. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. SMEs and corporate customers. Download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now is Ojinika Oji Okwe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinix. Good morning, Dr. And God is Friday. TGIF. Very good Friday to you. Yes. Ayo, how good are you? Good morning, Ojinika. I'm very well, thank you. Ojinika, wow. I, have to say, I, I didn't know when it came out. <laughs> you know, so influenced me. I was going to say Oji and Nika came out. You will never believe the first day I heard him call me Ojinika, I almost <laughs> passed on air. I was like, how did you call my full name? Good morning, Rafai. How are you? Oh, June. Happy Friday oh, to you. God. Great. Oh, Friday. Yes, GIF. <laughs> well, good morning to you, viewers. Let's take a look at some trending stories. In Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari on Thursday congratulated the founder and chairman of Arise Media Group, Prince Nduka Obaigbena, as well as the management and staff of the Arise News Channel on its 10th anniversary of international broadcast. Buhari commended the organization for their efforts in ridding Nigeria of colonial mindset and promoting pride for the nation's heritage. Subsequently, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, also hailed the broadcast station on its 10th anniversary. In a tweet on Thursday, Atiku noted that it was evident from the beginning that Arise TV, Prince Sunduka Obaibina's brainchild, which was set up to tell the African story from an African perspective, held great promise. Then. 
19 people were rescued on Thursday from the rubble of a collapsed three-story building that was under construction in Abuja. The building at the 7th Avenue area of Guarimpa was said to have collapsed at about 2.41 p.m. Three people are feared dead and over 40 others are suspected to be trapped beneath the rubble. On the sports, Super Eagle striker Victor Oshimen has won the Serie A Goal of the Month award for January. Oshimen scored a volley in Napoli's 2-1 league win over AS Roma on Sunday. It was the 24-year-old's 14th league goal of the season, keeping him at the top of the Serie A goal scorer's table. Welcome everybody to the 20th edition of Arise Fashion Week and Jazz Festival. We are thrilled to have you join us for this iconic event. Finally, on our entertainment, the 20th edition of Arise Fashion Week themed Jazz Festival Future Forward kicked off on Thursday. Nigerian designer Pepper Rowe opened the lineup of designers. The event featured a jazz performance by French jazz artist FKJ and an appearance by supermodel Naomi Campbell. That was fun last night. You all are asking me when is the party, yes, when is the jazz performance. Yes, it's all unraveling. There's more fashion today. I believe Kenneth Eze is also showing tonight. Ito Mbasi is showing. Oh, and yeah. your guy probably will be performing tonight. Hopefully, heavy the, Hancock. I can't wait. The finale is going to be on Saturday. So oh, we look that's forward. when you sell pepper soup and jello fries. <laughs> we don't do pepper soup and jello fries, unfortunately. Sorry, Dr. Abati. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, all right. Let's begin what's trending. Amid speculations arising from allegations made by the governor of Kaduna State, Nasiru El Rafai, that elements in the presidential villa were undermining the chances of Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress. The governor on Thursday clarified his stance, insisting that the elements he referenced know exactly who they are. He spoke with Charles Onyagulu on our nightly program, Primetime. Let me restate exactly what I said. Uh, I'm a quantity surveyor. I, I am mathematically uh, 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 tuned to be accurate, even in my use of words. What I said was, we are convinced that there are elements in the villa, some elements in the villa that want APC to lose the elections. I did not say the federal government. I did not say Asiwajibola Tinubu. I said APC, all right? Um, so I don't understand why the federal government is responding to what I said, because the federal government is not part of it. And I refer to elements in the villa, and I know who I'm referring to, and those that are in the villa know who I'm referring to. Well, in another development, the, government on, the governor on Thursday dismissed the chances of the Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi winning the presidential election. In a live television interview, the Kaduna state governor said Peter Obi does not have the necessary support across all states to win the election and described him as a Nollywood actor. Let's take a listen before we take some reactions. How can Peter Obi win any election. Peter Obi is polling 1% in Sokoto, 2% in Kazina, 5% in Kanu. That's why the votes are. All states are not equal. The fact that you are doing 70% in Anambra state does not mean somebody doing 10% in Kanu is not better than you. Kanu is 4 million votes that actually happen. Anambra is what? The, the number of votes in Anambra is the size of one local government in Kaduna state. So all states are not equal. If you poll states and you make them equal, yes, Peter Obi will sweep uh, the southeastern states. He will do well in south-south. Where else? He's not polling well in the uh, southwest, other than a drop in the ocean in Lagos. He is polling in the Christian enclaves in the north. He's polling well. But how many are they? How many? Peter Obi cannot win the election. 
He doesn't have the number of states. He doesn't have 25% in more than, the last time we checked, in more than uh, 16 states. He can't go anywhere. Peter Obi is a Nollywood actor, and that's all he will be. This election is between the APC and the PDP because they have the footprint, they have the spread. Ethnicity and religious bigotry will not take you anywhere. And that's what the Labour Party campaign is about. All right, let's take some tweets. Well, this person wrote, I totally agree with El Rufai. Peter Obi is a Nollywood actor. In fact, Dati is a Cannywood actor too. Come on, trader, who is campaigning with just four people in a room. Peter Obi cannot even win his state, Anambra, let alone 36 states. Labour Party is going nowhere. Thanks, El Rufai, for this revelation. Well, Okbara wrote, I really understand the pain this man feels. No one will take it lightly with a Peter Obi that was supposed to be unable to pull 200 people in El Rufai's Kaduna, but instead did three successful rallies in El Rufai's Kaduna. El Rufai, please accept our condolence. <laughs> well, another person wrote, El Rufai is stirring up controversy. This idea of population density in the North is a myth. It's been debunked. The Middle Belt and Southern states can't be paying more tax, consuming more resources, and spending more on energy. Yet, the North claim a higher population. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm coming to you, Rufai, because you <laughs> always quote data and statistics. What do you make of that last tweet before we talk about everything? At first, that's why we have a census coming up this year, and I please every Nigerian should go out there and be part of the census coming up after elections, so we can have empirical data. But secondly, we challenge Mr. El Rufai to bring out the data that shows that Peter B is polling 1% in Katsina and Kaduna and some other states he mentioned. Because they are the ones that are quick to say, oh, the data is rubbish. When uh, these people, when Bloomberg released their data, they said it was wrong. So please, he too should be able to bring out the data mm. that shows that Peter B is polling 1% or 2% in those states. And if he says a presidential candidate is a Nollywood actor, it speaks so much of him as a person and the character. It speaks so much of Mr. El Rufai as a character. Presidential candidate of a political party, it has degenerated to you abusing presidential candidates now mm. and calling them all sorts of slurry names. Anyway, if Peter Obi's presidency is comedy to him, I would tell him something that is not comedy to him. The fact that workers have been denied their rights in Kaduna State is not comedy. The fact that there's massive insecurity and killings in Kaduna State is not a Nollywood film. I think he should face that in a state, probably act that well and ensure there's a resolution to the season film of insecurity and Nollywood movie of insecurity happening in the state first before you abuse another presidential candidate. The things he said yesterday, I also challenge him to name the names of people that are against the presidential ambition of the APC presidential candidates. He should name them. We keep asking this question because today now they have gone to the Ville and that's why please will call on President Muhammad Buhari. Let common sense, let a heart and political will prevail. We have on good authority that over seven governors are there from different states, from the APC now. They are about to enter a meeting. Why is it that it's only the APC that is complaining about this Naira redesign? Like uh, Professor Imole uh, said, we are happy. He's a presidential candidate of the Accord Party. They said we are happy at least votes of Nigerians will come. But why is it that for over four days now, the APC have only been the party that has been complaining about this. Other parties have not complained about it. Why is that the case? He says he has empirical evidence. He says he has uh, evidence as regards conspiracy. He should release the evidence before the elections. You see, we just want free and fair elections, and we don't want monetization. Because formerly, people used to buy elections in this country. It was always about the highest bidder. And President Muhammad Buhari is trying to stop that with this Naira policy. Yes. We just hope that after this meeting, we don't see another extension. Because we know that was how President Muhammad Buhari was met, they met with President Muammar Brad the last time to be able to get the first extension. Please, Nigeria is bleeding already, and these political actors should cease. This country is for all of us, not only for their personal interest alone. Right.
You know, Ayo, we were discussing yesterday only about Aisha Buhari backing Erufai's statement, that first story that I took. Like Rufai said, what is the use for Nigerians to know that there are people in the ASO um, rock sabotaging, you know, either the elections or whatever, or what have you? Why is it coming out now? Mm. Why can't he name these people? Well, that's a big question, and we're looking forward to him responding to Nigerians mm. by actually naming these villains. Yeah. He mentioned, in a cli still clarifying, because as we identified earlier, he'd gone to a number of media houses mm. to speak about his statement, absolving the president of any wrongdoing, and instead saying that there are people... In fact, he actually said in one of the interviews that are, some of them are not APC members. Mm. They are just people, allies, who come around the president and offer him bad advice. And so the question, again, to ask is, who is really in charge of the economy? Who is in charge of Nigeria? Who makes the final decision? Who does the box stop with? Because with APCs, you know, with Governor L5, APC coming out to say, say that, oh, it's not the president, it's people who are not even loyal to the party, who do not want not just the presidential candidates to win, but APC as a party in itself to win, coming from his interviews. It would really help Nigerians to know who these bad eggs are. It would really help Nigerians to understand why it is pegged on the narrow design and the fact that all of a sudden, you know, the APC members are seeing the hardship of Nigerians that they are not able to access these narrow notes. I'd like to also ask him that hope they are also engaging or expanding this same energy to other issues that are affecting Nigerians and speaking to the president or fishing out the bad eggs who are giving the president this bad advice right. as to, you know, um, the scarcity of petroleum, um, the cost of price, inflation and other matters, security and other matters beyond right. just the um, redesign of the narrow notes. Dr. Abati, is the week of tell it all, isn't it? Okay, first, let's deal with this buggy of uh, fifth column and setting elements in the villa. And, you know, that everybody is saying uh, they cannot uh, name those persons. Who are the principal figures within the villa? I work there, I live there, <laughs> so I have an idea. You have the president, who is the president of Nigeria. You have the vice president, where you have the office of the vice president and his team, right? You have the chief of staff to the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You have the PAMSEC. State House, okay, who works with the chief of staff to run the administration. So these are the principal people. The rest of the people will be, you know, staff, starting with <clears throat> special advisors. The only major special advisor that has office there may be special advisor media, and maybe one or two. Uh, but they're, they're supposed to serve the president. They're supposed to serve the principal. Maybe the commandant of the brigade of guards, who comes in every morning to do their parade before the president uh, goes to the office. Okay, maybe another principal element in the uh, villa will be the wife of the president, the first lady who, ha who has an office there, and maybe the wife of the uh, vice president, you know, who will probably come in and go out. So who are these unidentifiable flying objects <laughs> inside the villa? Flying who are the ones influencing the president with regard to policy. It will be dangerous indeed if there are some faceless characters who are not official actors, mm. who are the ones dictating the policy of Nigeria. And that is why it is important for Nasir Rufai, who says he knows those people and that those people know themselves, to name them. Yes, If absolutely. they are not, uh, you know, people recognized under the laws of Nigeria, then it means that we are in a bigger tragedy Simple. than we can imagine. Absolutely. That unknown elements, like unknown soldiers, like unknown gunmen in the southeast, uh, that these unknown elements have taken over the presidency of Nigeria. That is the real problem, because the presidency of Nigeria is at the center of the democracy, number one. Number two, the point he was raising about, oh, there are uh, one local government in, uh, in uh, Kaduna State is more than the whole of Anambra State. In fact, that is part of the problem with Nigeria. Because Nigerians have been saying that, look, Nigeria has been organized in a lopsided manner, whereby you will have more local governments in Kano State than in Lagos State. Where all the states of the north will have more local governments, more allocation under Section 162 of the 1999 Constitution than almost all the states of the south combined. And we hope that this imbalance that Nasir Rufai is using uh, to demonstrate the strength uh, you know, the numerical strength of the North, translating into voting strength, will be one of the things 
that Nigeria at some point will address and we will have correct information about the distribution of persons in Nigeria. Well said, Dr. Bati. Well, in another development, the presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Paul Ahmed Tinubu, on Thursday took his campaign to Oshobu, the Oshun State Capital, where, among many other promises, assured students that they would spend not more than eight years for undergraduate programs in tertiary institutions if voted into power. Tinubu told the students to call him a bastard if he didn't fulfill his promise. Amada. Ilechesile, <laughs> Dr. Bati, over to you. Well, uh, incidentally, I showed Ajubala Ahmed Tinubu said a lot of other things yesterday at that campaign. I think this was in Oshobo. Yes. He talked about creating jobs. He talked about industries. He talked about education. He talked about tackling poverty, you know, and all of those usual things. However, the one that has caught the headline was what he said in Yoruba, saying you, you people will spend eight years in school. Well. I, I, I want to uh, try to get into his mind. You know, maybe what the uh, presidential candidate of the APC is saying is that he wants to win and he wants to do a second term. And what is good for the goose is good for the gander. So if he gets in there during the first time and the second term, Nigerian students should just stay with him to complete two terms. Except that the constitution of Nigeria does not say students are entitled, university students are entitled to a term of eight years. Even if you are doing medicine by six years, you are out of the school. So for him to do that, he will, he will need to change the curriculum so that people who are reading four-year courses can also do a second term. You know, I, I, I imagine that maybe that's where it's coming from. But where the problem is, is with secondary school education. We have a 6334 system. Is he going to change the... Uh, junior secondary school, primary school, and uh, senior secondary school to fit into eight years. But whatever it is, don't be surprised. Before the end of the day, his spokespersons will come and, and explain that maybe we don't understand <laughs> that what he's saying is that students should be entitled to two times in school. <laughs> Rufa, you said they started already. Uh, they started <laughs> already. So not anyway, not official message, yes. but they said oh, probably was talking about medicine students. Oh, and, uh, wow. Uh, 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 really? Yes, it's six years now. Mm -hmm. But they said, okay, maybe medicine plus <laughs> strike as always. <laughs> because, mm -hmm. But really, you know, only four years ago, Remember, we will give you student loan. Yes. Four years will, will be, be four, four years. years. Yes. Now, yeah, it's eight years. Or don't make job. Mm -hmm. Somebody who don't know. Maybe you should just stop speaking Yoruba. Because the last time you spoke Yoruba, what will let us have for violence? Is he happen. going to speak this now? Man, because <laughs> no English, no Yoruba. No, Which language? Then, you know, because I, I don't know. But you see, it's just indicative of these gaffes. They are becoming one too many. And people should tell themselves the truth. Don't they are spin doctor? I need tired now. Like the last one he said, the Senate president for article, he said selling president. Selling president. Oh. He tried to change it. Yeah, it I didn't saw even that. make sense. I saw that. Yeah. Are you quickly? Are you? That if he does become president, are we going to need an official interpreter so that every time he speaks, there's someone who has to explain to Nigerians what he actually means? That meant. is so yeah. excellent. That's what we've been really. Yeah. Well, well, thank you all you, for your great analysis. You also do two times. <laughs> two times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I'll see you all at Arise Fashion Week, correct? Yeah, right. All right. Well, that's all I have for you on What's Trending Today. I'll see you all next week. And that's all on today's edition of The Morning Show. Rotu Sodiri will be here next to take you through Global Business Report. Stay with us. It's the Arise News Channel.
there is only one place that the world will come to run on Saturday the 4th of February 2023. Over bridges, waterfronts, running across 10 kilometers and 42 kilometers of asphalt. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon will be targeting 100,000 runners from around the world, ready to flood the streets of Lagos. The 10 kilometer race will set off at 9.30 a.m. at the Grace Court Garden Events Place, Durasimi Eti, Lekki Face 1, while the 42 kilometer race will set off at 6.30 a.m. in front of the iconic National Stadium, Surulere. And both races will finish on top of the sandy shores of the stunning Echo Atlantic City. From Oshodi to Owuru, Alakbere to Admiralty, Ikoi to Echo Atlantic, the race is routed through the warm, meandering feet, blistering streets of this historic city. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to push beyond the limit. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon 2023. Make it count. My people, ha! my name is a maker. Make us come out. Let me get all this motor. I don't learn my lesson. Somebody come buy motor for my hand, carry big, big money, come give me. Now, when we get bust, now my eye open. I don't know, see that 419 EBA. Now, when EFCC, bam, bam, now they come bam me too. Now, he make me, they warn you, all of them, I want to do business like me. Where they carry big, big money, when I go, sometimes I go carry transfer, carry bring back. Yeah, they could not shine in my eye. Because <laughs> the special control unit against money laundering, when they call SCUMO, then that one say, if the money pass 5 million naira for individual, <laughs> no 